All right. Hello, and welcome back to Real Seekers. I'm your host, Dale, the Real Seeker. And today we have an extra special treat. It's something that I've been looking forward to for a couple months now and that sort of thing. The, the, ultimate, uh, the ultimate podcast panel review on specifically the 1988 Carbon 14 dating. And uh, just before I get into that, I'll, I'll introduce uh, the players that we have here. So immediately to my uh, right, we have uh, Dr. Thomas McAvoy. Hi, Tom. Welcome back. Hi. Nice to be back. Awesome. Awesome. And uh, we also have, um, uh, also coming back, this is the second time on the show, Michael Kowalski, the head of the BSTS. So, hey, Michael, how's it going on your end? Oh, fine. Thanks. <coughs> thanks, Dale. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Of course, um, everybody knows Joe Marino. He's been on the show multiple times. So, hey, Joe, how's it going on your end? Hey, good to see everybody. Welcome back. Welcome back. And um, the last, uh, we do possibly have an agreement. Uh, Bob Rucker may show up later on in the show um, to represent the pro shroud side as well. Um, but we have to have a shroud skeptic, right? It's not a show without a shroud skeptic. But for once, it's not Hugh Ferry. I'm giving Hugh a good break. So we have Jordan from the <coughs> podcast. So how's it going there, Jordan? Otherwise known as we have Hugh Ferry at home. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right, cool. So, so the first thing I want to do is just take a, cu a couple quick minutes just to briefly introduce the audience for, you know, obviously this is Jordan's first time on the Shroud Wars, so he may not know who all the players are. So I uh, just want to go around, take a couple minutes to introduce who you are, your kind of area of expertise uh, in relation to the Shroud and stuff like that. So uh, yeah, Michael, I'll start with you there. Thanks, Dave. Well, I'm, uh, I'm a, a, a graduate in physics, had a career in, uh, initially in textiles and then within um, the IT industry, implementing business systems into uh, major banking clients. Um, but uh, over the last several years, I've taken a, a particular interest in the, uh, in the scientific evidence concerning the shroud, and in particular, uh, evidence related to the uh, the dating uh, of the shroud. So there's obviously p most people are well aware of the carbon dating project, uh, some more than others. There's obviously been a lot of controversy about that dating, and that's one of the things we'll be discussing today. But there's also a whole host of other dating evidence. There's relative dated evidence where we have artifacts which appear to have been inspired by the shroud that date well back before the medieval times that uh, uh, the shroud is was believed to be created if one accepts the radiocarbon date and then there's other dating tests that have been performed so it's a it's an interesting uh, topic of research and there's a lot of material there uh, but that's really where my main interest has been over the past few years Awesome. Awesome. All right, cool. And uh, Joe, I'll, I'll go to you. What, uh, you know, who are you and what's kind of your expertise in relation to the shroud? Uh, I've been studying the shroud since 1977. So uh, just hit my 47th year. Um, I'm a former Benedictine monk. I started studying the shroud before I became a monk, actually. Um, but uh, I kind of see myself as a generalist, uh, with, uh, but with a special interest in the the C14 dating. Um, uh, in 2020, I published a 800-page book on the C14 dating. Um, I've also written quite a few articles, about a hundred, over a hundred, I think, between academia and and on Shroud.com. So I've pre I've read pretty much everything um, of major significance in the English language. And um, with the help of Google, I've also um, tapped into some uh, foreign uh, articles and, and books by prominent foreign crowd uh, researchers. Um, and I, I see myself um, probably one of my, I think, talents is to be able to connect dots. Um, so when I, I read practically everything, and so I'm able to... Uh, connect a lot of dots that people who aren't as well read might not see or be aware of. Um, and I think when I've connected dots, I, you know, a, a lot of interesting things come out. Um, 
and I have quite a large collection, probably one of the best uh, two or three, if not the best personal English language uh, collection of Shroud materials in the world. And I read all the skeptical stuff as well. Um, of course, there isn't quite as much as that, but I do read it when I come across it. And in fact, I found a new one on academia this morning that will be in my next posting. I have a weekly Shroud uh, kind of email list that uh, I send to people all over the world. And Easter week, Holy Week and Easter week this this year was just unbelievable. I think I had to do, I usually do it once a week, but there were so many entries this, this year, I had to do five postings in about five days. I think I had over 80 entries. Uh, a lot of them were videos these days. Um, but there's a, as Michael said, there's a, there's a ton of information out there. Awesome. All right, cool. And going up to my far right, uh, the newcomer, Jordan, the Shroud Skeptic. So yeah, just take a couple minutes to introduce the, the guys to who you are and kind of your expertise and involvement with the Shroud. Sure. Uh, so I'm Jordan. My <coughs> expertise such as it is, is that I'm a nuclear engineer. Um, I've heard vicious rumors that some people don't believe me, but all I can tell you is that uh, I graduated in, I think it was 2018. I think it was 2018 from uh, Virginia Commonwealth University. I have a degree that's ABET accredited as a nuclear engineering degree. And I also work in the nuclear industry, though my job has nothing to do with uh, anything here. I'm, I work in probabilistic risk assessment. Uh, so I wouldn't consider myself an expert in basically anything to include nuclear engineering. Uh, but, you know, I can do some math and I know a little bit about physics. Um, as to my involvement with Shroud Research, I have a hobby, which is a video uh, uh, thing on YouTube. And I did some videos on the Shroud of Turin and they exploded. So I kept doing them. Uh, so <laughs> that's, uh, that's my involvement, such as it is. Awesome. Uh, yeah. Yeah, great. Well, great to have you. As I said, welcome to the Shroud Wars. So, uh, all right. And last but not least, we have uh, Dr. Tom McAvoy. So, uh, Tom, just so you know, there is an echo coming from you. So I'm going to have to mute and unmute you throughout the show. So, you know, raise your hand uh, when you want to speak. But yeah, go ahead now. Okay, I, I can turn my microphone down if that would help. Um, my name is Tom McAvoy. Um, I have, or I, I did teach chemical engineering for just shy of 40 years, first at the University of Maryland for 16 years, and then in, at the University, uh, sorry, at the University of Massachusetts, and then 24 years at the University of Maryland. Around uh, maybe 2014, I went out to a conference uh, in St. Louis. I believe Joe was there. I got to meet him. and. Uh, it was on the shroud, and that's when my interest uh, developed. And maybe five years later, uh, I really became interested in the ultraviolet photographs of the shroud that had been taken by STIRP, and they came online in 2019. Gil Lavoie uh, was instrumental in, in getting them online, and uh, I started analyzing them. And I published uh, three papers on them and one conference paper. And the interesting thing about those uh, photos is that they are actually photos of the shroud itself. So they contain data about the shroud. And I've also just recently published a, a book in the general area of faith and science called God the Geometer. And there's a section in the book on the shroud. So that's my background. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much. So, yeah, with that said, uh, I think we can get straight into today's topic on the 1988 carbon 14 dating. And the first thing I'm going to do is uh, let each of the guests give, you know, a 10 minute or less uninterrupted opening on their take on the carbon 14 dating. So I'm going to start with Joe Marino on this. He requested to, to start the openings there. So, yeah, Joe, go ahead and take it away. Um, I recently, <clears throat> recently got an email from somebody who's reading my C14 book and, um, there was a paragraph that kind of didn't make sense to him. And, um, I went back and looked at it and that portion, uh, had been scanned and, uh, much to my dismay, I discovered that the scanning wasn't very, it wasn't as accurate as it should have been. So, uh, the paragraph 
was missing some words and whatnot. So um, I went back to my original source um, and that, that was a letter, a personal letter I'd received in um, 1988 before the carbon dating from one of the C-14 scientists who was involved in the planning. His name, he's uh, deceased now. Uh, his name is, was uh, Dr. Garmin Harbottle, who was with the Brookhaven um, Labor National Laboratory in Upton, New York. And um, when I went over the letter again, I realized how, oh, sorry, for some reason I'm out temporarily. So try to get back in here. There you go. I recently Goodbye. updated or uh, uh, upgraded my um, internet service to, to try to alleviate this, but it has it still looks like some problems. Anyway, um, so uh, Harbottle uh, is not a small figure in the C14. He's mentioned 75 times in my C14 book. He worked with Harry Gove of um, the Rochester lab, who um, was hoping his lab would uh, be picked for the C-14, but because of the politics, uh, Gove ended up being uh, uh, not part of the testing. And he was very upset. And he and um, Harbottle actually held a press conference in New York in January 1988 to, to protest the one of the changes in the protocols uh, for the C-14 dating. Now, um, this letter was dated October 4th, 1988. So that's about nine days before the official results were announced. And I thought this letter was is, is important enough that I wanted to read most of it, kind of to, to set the stage. So, um, and this, this is on <clears throat> um, Brookhaven letterhead and, and Dale's gonna post a link to it uh, in the blog so people mm -hmm. can go back and see it. But I, I do want to read most of the letter. Um, and he says, uh, C-14 dates do need to be approached with caution. But the question of whether the carbon in the shroud is the same carbon as in the flax harvested to make the linen is not a valid objection. Unless the samples were taken from a restored place, I mean, so he's talking about a possible reweave there, it must be the same carbon. Otherwise, there would be no textile. Contamination is a valid objection. And he says, at the Turin conference, that was in um, 1986 when they planned the protocol, uh, uh, late September, early October, uh, 1986. And they came up with a whole bunch of protocols, but ended up um, not using them. So he says, at the Turin conference, it appeared that Prof Professor Chagas, a most distinguished biologist and president of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences, which is the Pope's um, scientific advisory board, was in charge. At this meeting, which was to draw up the plan uh, or protocol for C-14 dating by consensus, only Ganella raised the issue of two or three laboratories to conserve the precious cloth. All other scientists and Professor Chagas forcefully voted for the seven laboratory protocol with blind distribution of coded samples. But Ganella had another agenda and had no intention of abiding by the protocol. His reason was not conservation of the precious cl uh, cloth. He eventually cut off 50% more than the amount specified by the protocol, but a deep personal antagonism to one of the scientists who eventually uh, was to be eliminated. And he see, Carbottle says, that scientist was not me. It's 100% sure he's actually referring to Harry Gove there. Um, he worked through the Archbishop of Turin who blindly followed his advice. Around November, December of 1986, the Archbishop sent a letter to the Holy Father. The Pope replied in January 1987, essentially telling the Archbishop to proceed as he thought best. In this, the Pope clearly acted out, out of a desire not to contradict the wishes of the Archbishop, 
But in doing so, he obviously went against the advice of his own Academy of Science. Found out what had happened. Professor Chagas is reported to have said he felt like, quote, he had been kicked in the belly, end quote. It is also reported that at one point earlier, the archbishop had tried to have Professor Chagas replaced as president of the academy. The higher authorities of the mother church obviously know how to play hardball. The January 1987 letter of the Pope to the Archbishop was the basis of the latter's claim that he had been instructed by the Holy Father to limit the testing to three laboratories. I am sorry, but that was not the case. The thrust of the request went the other way, turned to Rome, and was merely permitted or endorsed by the Pope. <clears throat> In this letter, the Pope also agreed to remove the Ac Academy of Sciences from any further participation in the dating exercise. All of the above is for your information, Brother Joseph, and it is not to be attributed to me. Now, I, in the book, I didn't identify him, but uh, he's been gone about eight years now, and I, since he is dead, I, I thought it was okay to, to finally identify him. The original cause of Ganella's antagonism is that the scientists in question referred to Ganella as a charlatan, and this was duly reported to Ganella by one of the Sterp scientists, who obviously did not know what he would accomplish by it. After the actual data is released, we will know a little more. But Otlet, who was uh, the head of the lab at um, Harwell in England, who was also whose lab was rejected, Otlet pointed out to me that. With no blindfold, the three labs were free to check with each other and harmonize their dates if they initially disagreed for any reason. The volume of leaks that have occurred tells you that there were ample opportunities for intercomparison and that the vows of secrecy the three labs took were just so much rubbish. If I were, as you may be a believer, then my main objection would be the lack of blindfold coding of the samples. That in itself renders the test unscientific and forever suspect. One very distinguished C-14 scientist has said that the three lab plan would never have passed peer review. It is a pity that Ganella, who once admitted that he understood nothing about C-14 dating, was in charge. What you now will have is a result that will please some, disappoint many, and prove nothing. So I have a, a couple additional um, comments uh, on that letter. Um, so I already mentioned that he mentioned, uh, alluded to the possibility that the sample was repaired. Didn't say whether he believed in that or not, but at least he he was open to the possibility that there was a repair there. Um, all the note, all the notes, and in, in, in what he said about Ganella and Chagas and the Pope and the Archbishop. There's a lot of politics there. I mean, <clears throat> it doesn't look like scientific rigor was was the the primary focus there. Um. And, you know, the labs were, were not supposed to consult with each other, and they apparently did. Um, you know, so it, so it shows that the labs were not were seemingly not too concerned about rigor or integrity. Um, and then um, he says that, you know, that it's sus unscientific because of there's no, no, the lack of blindfold coding. I would add to that that I think it's unscientific simply because they only used one sample. They were supposed to use multiple samples to make sure that they had proper controls. You cannot be sure with one sample whether that sample was representative of the whole cloth. And to say that, you know, for someone to say that it would have been better that they, if they had used more samples, but then to accept the results, that you, I, I don't think you go there. I, you can't have it both ways. If, if, if it was, would have been better to have more, you should be able to say, okay, they didn't take more than one. The, the, the results are invalid because of that. I mean, there's been several science, uh, shroud scientific papers that have been retracted. 
There's no reason this paper shouldn't be retracted, but the problem is <clears throat> it's such high profile. It's, it was in Nature magazine and three prominent laboratories. There is no way they're going to uh, retract it because the publicity would be uh, devastating for them. So it go, you know, I, I just I just think it goes into um, uh, cover up mode. Um, let's see. So, but the the one one um, value I think in in problems with the C14 is that it has indirectly led to some people coming up with hypothesis uh, hypotheses on why this the dates came out the way they did. So I've I've got the invisible re reweave theory. Uh, Bob Rucker has his neutron flux. Um, but, you know, I, I don't think, I, I, I think that the results should be thrown out. And, you know, people say to me, oh, well, if it came out first century, you wouldn't be complaining. Well, if it did come out first century and I was aware uh, of all the uh, malfeasance that went on, I would say, well, personally, I think there's enough other evidence to support the authenticity of the shroud, I wouldn't have a problem throwing out the C14 date, even if it had come out uh, first century. Um, you know, C14 is not infallible. It can be accurate uh, if all if all the conditions are right. But you have to remember that most uh, objects that are carbon dated are, you know, buried or sealed or whatever. You know, the shroud's been out in the open since the 1300s. And it really wasn't from the beginning a very good candidate for something being carbon dated, but the you know desire by so many people to get a carbon dated um, you know, led the church to, to do it. But it was really a no-win situation for those that believe it's authentic because even if it had come out first century, and the skeptics could say, oh, well, the, the forger got a first century cloth. So I guess uh, one of the uh, hopeful things for the future is that there are other new dating techniques. Uh, Giulio Fonti of Italy has, has uh, done some recently. We have to wait and see if if those are um, confirmed or condoned by the, the larger scientific community. But um, I doubt if uh, people say, well, why don't they do another C14 test? Um, I doubt if they'll ever do an, another one because of the problems of the first one and the fact that it, well, it's also destructive and we, we now have dating techniques that are non-destructive. And so if, if new dating techniques are used in the future, I'm sure it'll be one of those um, non-destructive methods instead of C14. Awesome. Thank you so much, Joe. Um, all right, cool. So I will go immediately to Joe's left. Uh, Michael, why don't you take... 10 minutes or less or so and, and give your opening case and take on this carbon 14 dating. Sure. Cheers, Joe. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'd, I'd just like to go back a little bit really to uh, the mid seventies when uh, AMS was invented because really there's a, a, a nice little coincidence that occurred <laughs> around about that time because it was towards the late seventies when first of all, Harry Gove and his colleagues invented the new AMS technique of radiocarbon dating. And what that did was it opened up an entirely new uh, and profitable industry in carbon dating because all of a sudden it became possible to assess the age of organic materials using just a few milligrams of material, whereas previously you'd had to take significant chunks out of valuable artifacts to be able to, to date them. So we had that occurring at that time. And of course, it was a time when the church, or uh, well, initially the king of, uh, of Italy, but then later the church began to open up the shroud to scientific testing. So the two came together. The most obvious test to conduct with the shroud would be a radiocarbon date, and especially since it should be possible to do it using a tiny postage stamp sized fragment of material. And given the profile of the Shroud of Turin, and given the fact that there was such worldwide interest, particularly in the 1970s, when all the 
uh, tests that have been performed by STIRP and others that seem to uh, provide evidence that the shroud could indeed be authentic. Clearly, the radiocarbon test was something that was always going to attract a worldwide uh, attention, which indeed is what happened. And so the prize for any laboratories that happened to be involved in dating the shroud was really quite massive. It would mean that their profile would be increased enormously, assuming the test was a, a valid test and gave a, a, a result that was believable, then again, the reputation of the laboratories and the people involved would be boosted as well. And it was such a good prize that there were laboratories around the world that were keen to get involved over a long period of time and commit immense resource and time to this project, even though nobody was paying them. So the church, from as far as my understanding is concerned, the church didn't pay anybody for the involvement that they had over a period of nearly 10 years. So we then get to 1983 when I think it was um, uh, Robert Otlett of Harwell who decided that because there were so many laboratories involved, it would be a good idea to actually have some kind of test that would assess the accuracy of the various different laboratories and the two techniques that were in fashion at the time, which was the AMS and the uh, the, the more established gas counter technique. So that led to the intercomparison test that was supervised by Michael Tite from the British Museum, who of course eventually went on to supervise the radiocarbon dating of the shroud. And that test involved six laboratories, Oxford in England, Harwell in England. It involved Zurich from Switzerland and three labor laboratories from America, Rochester, Arizona and Brookhaven. Now, when they came to conduct that test, uh, Michael Tite, first of all, gave them a sample, which was uh, some Egyptian linen that was 3,000 years, dated to 3,000 years BC. That was tested and five of the six laboratories got a, a fairly accurate date, but the sixth laboratory had a date that was 1,000 years out, way out. A second sample was provided, which was uh, some Peruvian cotton that dated to 1200 AD. And in that particular instance, all six laboratories failed to date that accurately. I believe the dates came out between uh, 1400 AD and uh, 1670 AD. And then there was a final test, which uh, only five of the laboratories participated in. And again, it was another sample of uh, Peruvian cotton. This one dated to the period 1000 AD to 1400 AD. And once again, there was one laboratory that got a date that was way out, again, a thousand years out, whereas all the other laboratories managed to date this accurately. Now that as a series of tests wasn't a particular success and a little bit troubling that some of the um, results were um, really quite, uh, quite uh, big errors. And the laboratory in question, incidentally, that was getting the 1000 year inaccuracy turned out to be Zurich, uh, one of the laboratories that was chosen for the radiocarbon dating. Now, the reason why I mentioned the intercomparison test and what happened there is that I do believe that that actually had a direct bearing on uh, some bizarre decision that took place later on, and I'll come on to that in a few minutes. Um, but I just then also want to mention um, something that Joe briefly covered, and that was the, uh, the planning meeting that took place in, in Turin. Um, it was attended by various people, including the archaeologist Bill Meacham. And to repeat what Joe said, I think the general view there was it, they needed to take multiple samples from the shroud, and that was the agreement. And the reason for that is, is quite simply that anybody who at that time had had practical experience of radiocarbon dating knew that if you have an ancient object and you take samples from more than one area of that object, there is a good chance that you're going to get completely different dates. And of course, if that happens, well, which one's correct? And indeed, can we be sure that either of them are correct? 
So for that reason, there was a general view that a minimum number of samples that must be taken from any object in order to get a, a chance of a reliable dating was three. And that was the advice that was coming from uh, Bill Meacham, who was involved in the discussions, uh, other archaeologists such as Paul Maloney. There were people from the International Radio Car uh, Radio Carbon Calibration Centre, uh, Marion Scott and, and Dr. Baxter, who were also chipping in and giving their opinion. And consistently, the uh, message that was being given was you need to take a minimum of three samples for the test to be valid. Now, despite all that advice, um, just three months before the uh, carbon dating took place, uh, before the sample was removed, uh, there was a meeting in London, which was attended by Luigi Ginella, who was the uh, Archbishop's, uh, Archbishop of Turin's scientific advisor, and the directors of the three laboratories that were involved by this stage, because of course, as John mentioned, three, three of the six were, were uh, eliminated from the process. Now, at that meeting, according to a book written by Luigi Ginella, uh, and let me just quote here, he says, uh, the laboratories asked that the samples be taken from a single site in order to better guarantee the homogeneity of the results. And of course, that was very much in keeping with Luigi Ginella's preference as well, because quite frankly, he didn't want to be punching holes all over the shroud for obvious reasons. But given all the advice that was coming from radiocarbon experts, and given the fact that the directors of these laboratories were experts in radiocarbon dating themselves, it really is quite bizarre that they should have asked to get samples from a single site, knowing the risks that that uh, would give to this test being um, controversial. I think there's a good reason why they wanted that to happen though. And that is that they needed this test to be a success for the future of their laboratories and for the, and to uphold their reputations. And what better way to make sure that there's a good chance of success than having a single sample removed and having adjacent fragments given to the three laboratories, that gives you the best possible chance of having a consistent result across the three laboratories which would mean there would be fewer questions asked about why what that could be asked if the uh, results were dramatically different. And then we then have the, uh, the sampling itself, which was uh, uh, obviously, I think as probably people on the call know, uh, there were three control samples given to the laboratories to be dated along with the samples that had been removed from the shroud but rather strangely, Michael Tite, who was administering the test, when he gave the three control samples to the laboratories, he gave them a receipt that contained the date of each of those control samples. Now, why on earth would he do this? You know, it's, uh, uh, it, it seems really a, a very, very strange thing to, to do and indeed, a year later when he was being interviewed about it, Michael Tite said, well, in hindsight, it would have been better if I hadn't actually told them what the dates of the control sample should be. But, you know, quite frankly, he's a very, very highly regarded scientist. You just don't do that. You don't set somebody a test. You know, there's a, a, a standard process where you ask a question, you wait for the answer, and then you tell them whether it's right. You don't ask a question, give them the answer, and then say, what do you think? That's not really the way you conduct these kind of things. So that, that's always, I've always considered that to be really quite strange. But when you look at what happened with the comparison test, where there was such a huge diversion, uh, divergence, sorry, not a diversion. Well, it might've been a diversion, but there's such a huge <laughs> divergence between some of the results, clearly, I always think when you do a test like an intercomparison test or a pilot study, you look for lessons learned. And I think one of the lessons that Michael Tite learned was there's a risk if you don't tell people what the date should be that they're gonna have to give you. So one way of actually mitigating the risk that you could end up with an embarrass embarrassing divergence in the results obtained by the laboratories 
is clearly to have told them what the answers should be. It's, it's a suspicion I've got, but it seems to fit with uh, quite a few facts. And then, of course, obviously, after the test took place, I think we're all well aware of the fact that the, the test report that was eventually produced was really extremely controversial for various different reasons, lots of errors and anomalies. And as Joe indicated, we've had many, many years in which, uh, despite questions being posed to the laboratories and to the British Museum concerning uh, requests for reasonable requests for information or answers to questions about uh, apparent um, anomalies in the report, um, there hasn't really been any adequate responses or there wasn't any adequate response for 27 years until the raw data was uh, released uh, by the British Museum following a freedom of information request that effectively forced them, legally forced them to uh, uh, to release it. So it's all in all, I think the process is a little bit messy. I think the motivations of the laboratory to me are quite clear and, and frankly um, understandable as well. Because when you look at the six laboratories who were involved in the intercomparison test, three of them were selected for the final radiocarbon date and three weren't. Of those six laboratories, only three are in business now. The other three, Harwell, Rochester, and Brookhaven, those are not commercial radiocarbon dating laboratories. Oxford, Zurich, and Arizona are thriving. So as a strategy for uh, ensuring the longevity of their business, um, getting a, a what appears to be on paper a good consistent result between the three laboratories for all control samples and the and the shroud, that was a commercially a good move. Gotcha. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. All right, cool. So at this point, I want to turn to uh, Tom. So let me unmute you. Uh, <laughs> take uh, 10 minutes or less or so and, and give your opening case. What, what's your take on the carbon 14 dating of the shroud? Okay. Um, yeah. Michael mentioned the uh, freedom of information uh, uh, lawsuit that forced the release of the data. I'm going to say some things that I think Jordan may agree with and Bob Rucker would agree with if he were on. Um, uh, <clears throat> one of them is that uh, the statistics that were done or published in 1988 were not correct. And it did take that freedom of information lawsuit to get the actual raw data out. And when it was analyzed, uh, the conclusion was that you could not say that there was a fixed date uh, for the three for the uh, for the, the the three sets of samples that were analyzed by the three laboratories, and in fact there was an enormous gradient of about ninety years per inch. Uh, the sample was about an inch and a half long, and uh, so within an inch, the radiocarbon dating would change by by 90 years. Um, the other thing is that, uh, uh, and I, so I think that, you know, that's a, 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 an interesting fact that should be, uh, should be explained. Uh, the three dates, however, uh, do come out to be medieval. Uh, none of them are going back to the first century. And that's also something that uh, I think Barb Rucker would say uh, he would agree that those dates are probably accurate. And his neutron radiation theory tries to explain the gradient as well as the medieval dating. Uh, what I would like to do is kind of reverse what I did uh, in uh, analyzing the uh, ultraviolet uh, photographs of the shroud that were taken. And let me put on... Uh, couple of slides. So let me click on this and see if you see it. Does that yep. come up? Yep. Okay. okay. This is kind of the end of the research that I did, but I'm going to start with it. And what it shows is uh, some experiments that I did on neutron radiation of modern linen. 
It was published in the International Journal of Archaeology in 2021. And <clears throat> what's shown here is the, on the left, is the a plot of fluorescence intensity versus uh, neutron fluence or flux, uh, which then increases to the right. And if you look at the second plot with the green arrow, it shows that uh, neutron, increasing neutron radiation increases the fluorescence intensity of the, of the linen samples. So if, and, and one of the things with Bob Rucker's neutron, uh, neutron proposal is, is there a way to test it? Uh, is it something that's falsifiable? Uh, and uh, I believe that the shroud photos that were taken, the UV photos, provide evidence that uh, the shroud may well have been exposed to neutron radiation. And <clears throat> if I reverse what I did and just start with that and say, okay, uh, if the shroud, if the ultraviolet photos of the shroud had a fixed uh, fluorescence intensity, no matter where you, you took a photo of the shroud, that would disagree with this neutron radiation result that I'm showing here. In other words, this is saying that neutron radiation changes the fluorescence intensity. But if the shroud were photographed and had a constant fluorescence intensity, then uh, that would tend to rule out neutron radiation. So let me go to the next slide. Whoops, let's see, is that working? Now let me go down. There's the next slide. Um, <clears throat> this one uh, shows the shroud at the top. And you'll see three lines there. There's a red line, a green line, and a blue line. And when the STIRP team took ultraviolet photos of the shroud, they had a... Uh, a moving camera arrangement. So they went down the shroud and they followed the red line and they made eight photographs. Then they followed the green line, they made uh, eight photographs, and then the blue line and they made eight photographs. And I, I also show on there the radiocarbon date. To the left is the dorsal image and to the right is the frontal image on the shroud. Now, what I found when I analyzed the these photos, uh, which were published uh, in 2019 on the web, is some very interesting patterns. The shroud does not have a constant fluorescence intensity. It, and in fact, it changes in kind of an interesting way. If you look at the red line and the blue line, the red line uh, goes down the top half, what I'll call the top half of the shroud. The blue line goes down the bottom half of the shroud. And if you look at the plot on the bottom, the red line, the intensity, the fluorescence intensity from these photos is uh, always above the blue line. So the top of the shroud fluoresces more than the bottom of the shroud. And that's kind of an interesting result. The highest fluorescence intensity occurs down the middle of the shroud, the green line. Uh, and uh, you can see that again in the, in the bottom plot. And I'll point out here in the, in the bottom plot, if you look at the green line, there's a double maxima. So you get the first maximum, which is the global one in the dorsal image, and then the second one is in the frontal image. Uh, and the third thing, and it's a little bit more difficult to see, but if you compare the fluorescence intensity of the dorsal image to the frontal image, the dorsal image fluoresces more than the frontal image. I've got two arrows there, and the feet on the, uh, on the shroud show up in two places. They obviously show up in the front and on the dorsal image. So if you compare uh, the same spots on the shroud in terms of the anatomy, uh, you find out that the, the dorsal side fluoresces more than the frontal side, and the maximum that occurs is in where the torso is. So let me go down to the next slide and just, uh, now let's see here. It would be interesting. Um, well, let me just go to the next slide. I was going to try to, yeah, this, I, this may work. 
Um, so here's uh, a slide that shows Rucker's hypothesis about neutron radiation. And uh, he, he set this uh, simulation up. I think he published it in 2014. The body lies on a, uh, uh, a, a bench here, I guess he called it. And the back wall is, uh, is uh, next to one side of the shroud. And if you look at his simulation results, you get this green plot here. Now this is for going down the very center of his simulation. So it would start here and go down and then uh, actually come back because you'd have to do the dorsal side and the frontal side. But what you find is a pattern that looks like this. There's a double maxima. The circle over here is where the radiocarbon site uh, was, this was close to the radiocarbon site. And uh, let me see if this will come up. And it actually, let me try playing the slideshow from, from the current slide. Here's Rucker's simulation. And this is what I found with the ultraviolet photos. I get the same double maxima that he got when he did his neutron simulation. Now, in addition, if you, if you look at what I said on the previous slide, let me go back to the previous one. I have to do it three times here to go back. If you look at these trends that I pointed out here, that the, the, the red uh, area or the, the top half of the shroud fluoresces more than the bottom half, that's exactly what Rucker found in his simulation. If you look at the, the green area or the green line, it, it matches in the sense of the double maxima what he found in his simulation. And he also found that the dorsal side of the shroud uh, had a radiocarbon date that was higher than the frontal side. So every single trend that he had in his neutron simulation shows up in the shroud photos. And these are actually uh, contain data on the shroud itself. So uh, to me, this is interesting. Does it uh, absolutely confirm his, uh, his uh, neutron work? No, it doesn't. But it certainly is, uh, gives uh, uh, credence to what he's talking about, that in order to explain the, the medieval dates and this tremendous gradient, which you see over here, which he has in his simulation. This is, a, this is the 90 uh, years per inch gradient. Uh, neutron radiation is one potential explanation of all of this data. So uh, that's where I was coming from. And uh, uh, let me just stop there and uh, uh, end the show. And I can maybe go back and if I can figure out how to get back into the... Uh, just go to your, uh, there, there you we go. go. Awesome. So. Yeah, thank you so much for that, Tom. Uh, so last but not least, um, we, uh, you've got a fan, first of all, Jordan. Uh, so based theory is saying, go Jordan. We've got a, a fan of yours. I've been excitedly waiting for this one. So last but not least, I do want to go to Jordan to make his opening case in about 10 minutes or less or so. What's your take on the carbon dating? All right. Thanks. Um, so, Basically, since, since I'm the skeptic here uh, and I'm new to this show, uh, I want to explain a little bit about where I'm coming from. So uh, I'm a lot of things. I'm an engineer. Um, I'm an atheist, by which I mean I, don't, I believe no gods exist. Uh, but most importantly to me, I'm a skeptic. And a lot of people hear skeptic and that conjures images of someone who like doggedly refuses to accept anything they don't like, someone who um, is fundamentally opposed the idea of miracles, that sort of thing. Uh, that's not how I see it. Being skeptical for me is about embracing doubt. Uh, it's about withholding belief in something unless and until we have good reason to believe it. But critically, it also means being willing to then believe the thing once you've had that evidence, like changing your mind is a fundamental part of being a skeptic. Um, and I'm super excited when I'm shown that I'm wrong because then I can just change my mind. Then I'm not wrong anymore. It's like magic. Uh, so I don't think there's anything contradictory between being a skeptic and being religious. There are uh, non-religious skeptics like me. There are religious skeptics like Dale and Hugh Ferry and others. Uh, so, you know, 
being a skeptic, being religious, it doesn't it like those two are not contradictory categories. So we can all be skeptics together. Um, when it comes to the carbon dating, uh, I think it's important to clearly state like the question we're asking, like what's the problem we're trying to solve? What's the thing we're trying to answer? Uh, the, the answer, the, the thing we're interested in is, is the Shroud of Turin the burial cloth of Jesus? And as it pertains to radiocarbon dating, uh, for that answer to be yes, the Shroud has to be a first century relic. So it can't obviously could not have come into existence after Jesus uh, was buried in order for it to have wrapped him when he was buried, right? So any result from second to 20th century won't do. It has to be uh, first century. And this is important to recognize because while there are a lot of things that can influence uh, the results of carbon dating, there's contamination, there's incompetence, there's all kinds of stuff. Uh, unless the sum total of those things moves the date from the 13th century where it was dated to the first century, then it's not enough. I mean, it's certainly worth noting, uh, but an error of 10 years, 100 years, 1,000 years, still not enough. You got to get the whole way there for it to work. So, uh, we all know, everyone here knows, uh, probably more than me, about the, the radiocarbon dating. It was done in 89, or published in 89 anyway, in Nature, uh, dated 1260-1390. Unfortunately for everyone involved, though perhaps fortunately for me and my viewer account, uh, there were some flaws in the carbon dating that have caused the, uh, called those dates into question. Um, so there's a lot of things that can be said about it, but for me, there's like four facts. I'm, a, I'm just a simple engineer. Um, so keeping track of all this stuff is hard for me. So I try to distill it as much as I can. And so for my series on the carbon dating that I've been doing on YouTube, uh, I, when I'm comparing these various competing hypotheses, in fact, I just recorded the episode on the uh, reweave hypothesis last night. So hopefully we're releasing that next week. Um, shameless plug. You can watch them right now. Reason to doubt. Like, comment, and subscribe. Uh, so there's four facts that I think uh, you have to address by any hypothesis. So uh, fact one is that the samples, when they were tested by Arizona, Oxford, Zurich, uh, they they reported sufficiency 14 uh, such that it, it had a radiocarbon age in the Middle Ages. Uh, the second fact is that the uh, Arizona sample tested slightly younger than the Zurich sample. They were pretty, they overlap, but one was slightly younger than the other. Oxford, which is the furthest from the center, closest to the edge, uh, dated older than the other two, and those date ranges didn't quite overlap. Uh, fact three is that the labs tested samples of control samples of known ages, and those um, results accorded with each other. And fact four is per Riani et al. Um, there is that slope, like I just described, between the different labs. So the like which lab tested it and therefore its position on the shroud is significant. Uh, but the results uh, do not depend on the configuration of subsamples within each lab. So um, he did testing for like, there's all different kinds of ways you could cut a piece into four pieces, right? You could do it this way, you could do it this way, you could do it all kinds of funky ways. And so he did a bunch of different configurations and found that um, none of them were statistically significant. So basically, which lab did it, that's important, and thus where it is on the shroud kind of as a consequence, but how they did it within each piece, not important. <clears throat> so those are the four facts you have to explain. And there ends my prepared comments, so now I'm blinging it. Uh, the, there's, there's a lot of competing hypotheses. Um, I think we'll focus on the two that are important today and then the one that is my personal favorite uh, from what I've gotten today. So there's uh, the reweave hypothesis, which is that there's it dates this way because there was new fabric, new being 16th century fabric, that was woven in in a way that uh, is done so skillfully so as to escape detection. And um, basically the ratio of old to new stuff you need if it was done in the 16th century is 80 to 20 you need 80 percent new stuff and 20 percent old stuff so it'd be pretty threadbare at that point um when we analyze it spoilers i guess for the episode that's upcoming um i think that explains fact one and three very well i mean it's it it, it tested medieval because there's you know medieval stuff in there easy um i don't think it does as good a job it can accommodate the other facts certainly but i don't think it does as good a job of explaining the other two facts um that the the sloping and the fact that uh, the subsamples don't change. So, because the subsamples don't matter, uh, the patch would have to be very consistent. Sorry, not patch. I, I might say patch. I mean reweave. I don't mean a patch. Um, it, it would have to be very consistent across the entire repaired area. That eighty percent would have to be pretty consistent, but not perfectly consistent. In fact, there needs to be a step change between where Oxford took their thing and where I think the next one was Zurich. Well, or anyway, the next lab. 
uh, where they took their thing. So if we're going with the reweave hypothesis, then the shroud would need to be more threadbare up top, a little bit less threadbare, and that change from more to less has to happen where they cut, where researchers would cut hundreds of years ago. The reason that has to be that way is because if that step change had happened, not where they cut it, like if it was half in Oxford's and half in someone else's, then the arrangement of subsamples would matter. Then you'd get that big difference in the way they, they dated it. Certainly that could happen, right? There's nothing in there that is impossible, um, but I, I, you, have to, you have to accept that as, as an ancillary um, assumption. So the other hypothesis on offer is the neutron irradiation hypothesis popularized I think most famously by Bob Rucker, perhaps, but uh, other he's not the only one. Um, so this one basically posits that uh, the C14 is there because it was created in situ by a blast of neutron radiation. Um, the source is left unspecific, but everyone knows it's from Jesus' body when he resurrected, right? That's the, that's the idea. Um, and so how does that one fare? Well, uh, I think it can explain the facts. You've got the, the C14 to tested it because it's there. That's great. Uh, it can even do the slope because if you just assume that it's uh, average density and like it's evenly throughout the body, there's more body up that way than there is down that way. And that, hence you got the slope. Cool. So it can explain all of that. Uh, the, the big drawback to this, of course, uh, so when we rate it, we did a exploratory scope, explanatory power, conservativeness at hoc. It's not particularly conservative because it requires exotic physics or a miracle or, you know, what, however you want, whatever thing. There's stuff happening there that doesn't happen usually. Does that mean it's possible? No, of course not. It could not, could be possible. Uh, but that is something we'd have to accept in order to accept this hypothesis. And when you have to accept something like that, you should likewise require more evidence to accept the thing. Um, now, I will say, kudos to that hypothesis. It is easily falsifiable, which you usually don't get with a mir miracle claim. Um, this miracle claim or exotic physical claim or whatever you want to call it, you could test it. You could take, you, you could do carbon dating elsewhere and that the thing should taste in the future in the middle. So, Hey, like, dude, if you did that, I'm in like hundred percent, I think you could probably do it with a Geiger counter maybe. Uh, but anyway, until that testing is done, I'm not sure that we should accept a hypothesis that requires us to buy so much. So, uh, what do I think is the most likely explanation to date? Uh, so Oxford's um, cleaning procedures were a little bit different than the other two labs. Uh, they used petroleum ether, where the other two labs did not. According, uh, so I am told, I'm not an expert in this, but I, according to other experts, uh, petroleum ether is good at cleaning things that um, might be missed by other cleaning procedures. And the amount that Oxford's cleaning procedures need to be better, that, that, that was weird. The, the amount it would need to clean the more contamination we need to get rid of in order to make the Oxford samples line up with the other ones is very small. Like it's like a percent or so and weight percent, depending on what contamination it was cleaning and when that contamination showed up. Um, so basically we've got these three hypotheses in my mind. Uh, one of them requires exotic physics. One of them doesn't require exotic physics, but it requires a lot of things to line up. And one of them requires one of the lads to be just a little bit better than the other ones. And it seems to me that that's the simplest hypothesis. And so, lacking a compelling reason to do otherwise, we should go with the one that's simpler. Um, I don't think the evidence is such that we can say for sure it's any of these. I think more testing would be required. I would love to do more testing. If anyone knows the Pope and would like to get me in touch with them, I'd be happy to argue the point. Uh, but until that happens, you know, we can only go with what we have. So. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jordan. And guess what? We had a surprise appearance. Hey, it's Bob Rucker. How's it going there, Bob? Uh, just fine. I'm sorry for the delay here. I checked the time yesterday, and it was only two hours difference between me and Toronto, but now it's three, so I'm, I'm not sure what happened. Mm. Mm. No worries. So I'm glad you're here. So basically, all we did, uh, we've just gone over everyone's opening, you know, 10 minute or so opening speech there. So uh, perfect timing. We can, we can go to you. And um, yeah, if you want to, in the first place, um, I'll give you a little bit extra time, a couple extra minutes on top of the 10 minutes or so. But introduce um so we went around and everyone kind of introduced who they were quickly in a minute or so their background education background and stuff and their relevant experience to the shroud dating of the shroud and stuff so uh so incorporate that into your opening speech uh on the carbon dating there but yeah i'll give you about 12 minutes or so uh yes uh, i prepared 40 slides here to show and, and that would uh, just take 80 minutes uh and so uh, you know, this this uh, probably is not going to work. 
but uh, anyway, anyway. Um, well, if you if you uh, send me the slides after the show, I'll I'll post all forty of them <laughs> on my blog, so people. people yes, can yes, it, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah, you know, I, I don't use the word mir miracle or miraculous or supernatural. Uh, I don't think those are good terms. They're they're not not well defined. No, hardly anyone defines those terms when they start talking about them. Unfortunately, you know, I went to Costco the other day and and I got a parking space right in front of the entrance. What a miracle! Is that <laughs> what we mean by a miracle, or or do we mean by a miracle uh, it, that uh, a miracle is a violation uh, of natural law and therefore is logically impossible? Is that what we mean by miracle? Well, no. When we use those words, we need to define what we're talking about. And, and, I, and that's why I don't use those terms. So what I use uh, is a, an explanatory phrase. I, I say that, that we're talking about an event that is beyond or outside of our current understanding uh, of the laws of physics. Uh, and for, for example, uh, 200 years ago, it was said, that it would have to require a miracle for an airplane to fly because that would violate both the laws of gravity and the laws of buoyancy. Now, the laws of buoyancy come in because uh, a boat uh, floats to the depth at which it displaces the weight of water equal to the weight of the boat. So an airplane displaces a weight that is very small because it's just displacing air. So that therefore, it should, according to the laws of gravity and buoyancy, every airplane should crash, but it doesn't. Uh, and that's because uh, the uh, aerodynamic lift of the wing configuration overcomes uh, what we would otherwise consider to be uh, controlling laws of physics, gravity and buoyancy. And so what I'm saying here uh, is that when we consider the last 40 years of physics uh, in their attempt to construct a theory that explains all the forces on all the subatomic particles and is consistent uh, with all the experiments in modern physics, uh, they, they have to resort to string theory and their various string theories, there, there's several of them, uh, postulate that there's anywhere from 10 to 26 different dimensions of which our four dimensions, three in space and one in time, is only a very small subset. So that all the experiments that we have done that in all of human experience has only been done in four out of 10 to 26 dimensions. So that there's plenty of extra dimensions for, for uh, physics to overcome gravity, for example, and buoyancy for airplanes to, to fly. So that the argument that's usually made from miracles is simply a lack of uh, recognition of the necessity of additional dimensions. And indeed, this is exactly what Genesis 1.1 says. Uh, in the beginning, that's time had a beginning, uh, God created the heavens, that's everything that's up, and the earth, everything that's down, that's matter. So Genesis 1.1 implies that uh, time, space, and matter had a beginning uh, so, so that God, as creator in Genesis 1.1, brought them into existence from outside of time, space, and matter. Therefore, alternate dimensions exist biblically as well as from modern physics. So that we have to realize that the argument from miracles is simply not valid. Okay. Any further discussion on that? <laughs> no, if that's your, if that's your opinion, yeah, great. Uh, awesome. Thank you so much there, Bob. I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, at this point, now we get to the fun part. I, I'm going to open it up to kind of an informal dialogue between the, the panelists and that sort of thing. And just to give it somewhat of a, a structure up, I'll have uh, I'll try to make sure that each panelist gets a turn uh, initiating the informal discussion so that you know they can make sure they get out their important points and stuff like that. So um, I'll probably jump in every 20, 20 minutes or so, something like that, just to give the next person their turn to initiate. But uh, so I was planning to have Jordan the last on the openings and out of charity, I'm going to make him first in terms of initiating the opening discussion. So uh, 
yeah, Jordan, what uh, what do you want to discuss with these at guys? A, at a charity, you're going to put me in the hot seat? Uh, <laughs> so we'll get to serious discussions in a second, but this is the first time I've had so many proponents of the Shroud in one place at one time, and I, in all of my videos, have been struggling. What do you guys call yourselves? Because I've heard, like, Shroud proponents, I've heard Shroudies. I don't want to use the wrong word and offend anybody. So, like, what is the label that your group collectively uses? Uh, the safe one is Syndenologist. Is there a less but, safe one? <laughs> that a curiosity? Uh, shri shroudy. Shroudy. Yeah, is I that... don't agree. Shroudy is not very good. Uh, Syndenologist is good or just shroud researchers. Okay. You know, I, Syndon yeah. is the Greek word for the body cloth. So Syndenologist would be those individuals who are studying the body cloth discussed in the Bible. Okay. I don't think we're easily offended, though, Joe. So. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's good. Uh, so since I just, well, I mean, I'm the skeptic here. So I guess since I just did, I've got Reweave on the mind and I have Joe. Uh, <coughs> um, I was wondering if you have um, any thoughts on the opening that I just gave on it, uh, particularly the consistency that would be required across uh, the, yeah, so it would require 80% new material and 20% old. Mm. And it would have to be consistent across the whole thing, but it can't like the repair can't start or mm. stop within the repaired area. Um, so um, in, in your mind, does that play into it at all? Do, do you th is there any evidence that that is in fact the case? Mm. Mm. Um, you know, I, I'm no textile expert and I'm no chemist. And I, I, as I said in my opening, I connect dots and all I see, I see a lot of experts saying, yeah, this, this area has been manipulated. Ray Rogers found a cotton linen splice. I mean, uh, people can come up, people do come up with uh, various explanations. So, um, you know, I, with all the technical details, a lot of that just goes over my head. So I really don't have, I, I'm, I always hope some, some expert will come along and rescue me when I don't know the answer. And this is one of those cases. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Tom, you're muted. Uh, I was going to. Uh, I was going to say Bob Rucker has commented on the statistics of the re re reweave idea, and I think Jordan used that in your show. To, to so I don't know if he'd want to say anything. Well, let's see. In my paper number thirty three on my website shroudresearch.net. Uh, I go into what I think is my best explanation of carbon dating, the carbon dating issue. And I had uh, this this was a, a long development over a 10 year period because I had written 13 papers uh, on the carbon dating. So paper 33 puts it all together. Uh, and in, in that paper, uh, I list uh, m multiple different problems as I see it uh, with the invisible reweave. Uh, now, the advantage of the invisible reweave, I'm, I'm trying to get out my paper here. Um, the in advantage of that is it's simple. It's easy to understand. Uh, and, and of course, my, my concept uh, is, is much more complex, but the complexity results from the complexity of the evidence so that it's justified. Now, the, the argument for simplicity uh, is, is generally used when, when you have uh, two hypotheses that are equal in all the other basis for acceptability. Now, the criteria for accepting a hypothesis is, first of all, you know, the top level is consistency with the evidence. If the hypothesis is not consistent with the evidence in any sense, then it cannot be true. Uh, the, the second criteria is that it makes predictions. Now, a, a good hypothesis, to be called a good hypothesis, must make predictions. Now, the, those predictions uh, should be testable. Uh, prediction is no good if it's not testable in a scientific sense. It should be testable. It should be falsifiable. Now, what that means is that if the test is performed and the prediction does not come true, that, then that test would falsify the hypothesis. At least it ought to. That's falsifiability. Uh, another criteria related to testing 
uh, is it a hypothesis? Uh, if it makes unique predictions, that's highly attractive to a scientist. Uh, a unique prediction is one that no other hypothesis makes. And of course, my hypothesis of neutron absorption does make unique predictions uh, in the unique distribution of carbon date uh, across the shroud. They should be easily testable with even one carbon date for material that's already been removed from the shroud. So, you know, that, that's very testable. Uh, and, and then the simplicity uh, ar argument is, is kind of that third level, uh, is, is part of the third level uh, of criteria. But if you have two hypotheses that equally satisfy all the evidence and are equally good in making predictions that are testable, falsifiable, uh, and unique. Then to decide between those two hypotheses for additional effort and funding and whatnot, you, you, you can apply the simplicity argument. Uh, so the, the simplicity argument doesn't mean that the alternative hypotheses are false. It just means that if, if we want to put in our time and money and effort uh, and in, intellectual uh, you know, effort uh, on, on it, it's easier to work on the simpler hypothesis. But that doesn't uh, nullify or invalidate the more complex hypothesis, if you understand what I mean. So that those would be the usual criteria for a scientist to follow. It must satisfy all the evidence. It must make uh, good predictions and uh, preferably, if possible, those predictions should be uh, unique. Oh, the other third level criteria would be that if a hypothesis uh, satis uh, or satisfies and explains multiple mysteries, that's re regarded as being highly desirable. So that, that my uh, vertically collimated radiation burst hypothesis does that. It, it, it would explain image formation, carbon dating, and possibly even why the blood that, that could have dried on the body is now on the cloth, which is another mystery in, in my mind. So, so uh, you laid out some criteria, which um, most of those I'd agree with. There's a couple things, though, that I didn't hear you mention. So, <clears throat> for example, well, we can I talk about simplicity in a second. Well, I guess you've mentioned it, so we should talk about it now. Um, when I say simplicity, I mean something more akin to like less ad hoc. So like it requires us to to accept fewer additional entities or fewer additional assumptions that aren't otherwise yeah. evidenced. Um, is that what you mean, or, or is that a factor when you're okay. distinguishing? Oh, okay, now, it, it, in those criteria, it's not actually relevant how you arrived at the hypothesis. You know, I could have a flying saucer land in my backyard and a little green man get out and tell me what hypothesis uh, I should use for explaining this. And sure, I can put that hypothesis forward as long as it explains the data. It makes good predictions, uh, some of which ho hopefully explain multiple mysteries uh, and hopefully it's simple. So if I get that from a little green man coming in on a flying saucer, it can still be tested scientifically. So it really doesn't matter uh, where the hypothesis comes from. Now, there's going to be assumptions in, in any hypothesis, hypothesis. A lot of times it depends uh, on the educational background, the experience background, all, all these different factors coming in. So I'm not exactly sure what you mean by ad hoc. My, my hypothesis makes one assumption just one. Uh, and that assumption uh, it is that there, there were, uh, there was a burst, extremely rapid burst of radiation from within the body with charged particles, probably protons, forming the image uh, and neutrons uh, shifting the carbon date uh, and the kinetic energy uh, of motion of these particles could, could possibly which should be taken in, just taken into account, it possibly uh, thrust the blood off the body onto the cloth. So that, that's just really one one hypothesis that I'm making. 
so when I mean ad hoc, I don't mean like uh, where you got the idea. Like it doesn't matter if it came to you in a vision or whatever. Uh, what I mean is like, for instance, um, something I mentioned in the episode, which none of you have seen. So uh, <laughs> uh, anyways, uh, so suppose for, for Joe's hypothesis, for example, um, he, he posits, and correct me if I misspeak, Joe, but I think this is accurate, posits that uh, a rich benefactor basically had possession of the Shroud. He didn't posit this. We know he did. They did. A rich benefactor had the Shroud in before 1532, um, and that's why they could afford this, what would be a very expensive repair, right? Uh, but suppose, hypothetically, this isn't the case, but suppose it were, that we knew that in that time period, the Shroud was actually owned by very poor people who didn't have wealth or money or anything. They didn't have access to that sort of stuff. Then we would, in order for Joe's hypothesis to work, you would have to suppose an otherwise unevidenced wealthy benefactor who came in and did the thing, right? Now, that's not possible. Wealthy people did it. Sometimes wealthy people do nice things, whatever. Uh, but that would be ad hoc because you wouldn't have in this hypothetical any ad other evidence that supports it, right? Um, and so that's what I mean by ad hoc. You have to pull in uh, basically things just to address a piece of evidence that you have in front of you. Um, and so I think that's a factor that has to be uh, addressed. And also conservativeness. And by that, I mean it accords well with other well-evidenced uh, things that we have good reason to think are true. So, for example, if a hypothesis requires us to throw general relativity out the window, we should require the hypothesis to have pretty darn good evidence for that because we have really good evidence for general relativity and we really like it, so we should want to keep it, right? Um, and it seems to me that a hypothesis that requires, we'll say, exotic unknown physics, uh, to avoid the word mar miracle, uh, that is a pretty big mark against a hypothesis B because even if it fits the evidence perfectly, you can easily fit the evidence perfectly by just conjuring whatever kind of explanation you want. I'm not accusing you of doing that. I'm just saying you could. Uh, and so I don't think you can just hand wave away the fact that your hypothesis requires exotic physics, whereas Joe's doesn't. I, I object to the use of the word exotic. Okay. What uh, word would you like it, me to use? Okay. Uh, different. New, un, unknown, previously unknown. Unknown, yeah. Okay. Uh, cool. we're, we're talking about a, a physics that is outside or beyond our current understanding of the laws of physics. Now, of course, the history of physics uh, uh, has, has shown development. Th that is that physics has always developed based upon discovering new laws of physics. So we cannot rule out the possibility of there being new laws of physics, ju just as aerodynamic lift on, on the wing structure can overcome gravity and buoyancy. Well, I don't now, think we, you can... we, we wouldn't We wouldn't li list... Uh, aerodynamic lift on the wing structure is being exotic physics. Previously unknown. Uh, I'm just yeah, trying to express unknown. It's just physics that, we unknown. Don't, that would contradict or at least uh, supersede our current understanding of physics in some way. Yes. And right. Okay. I, I agree. You Just because it does that does not mean it's false because that's yes. happened in the past, right? Yes. But would you agree that if something is going to require that as part of its explanation, that that greatly increases the amount of evidence we would need in order to reasonably accept it. Would you agree with that? Not necessarily. No. No. So, so by let, not let necessarily, it, so, it depends on the evidence. It all depends on the evidence. Now regard, there is no, there is no hypothesis that has been proposed that explains image formation, carbon dating and how the blood got on, on, on the shroud. There's no other hypothesis. There's only one, and that's mine. I mean, okay. So but... you, you make light of the fact that, well, if I come up with a hypothesis, then anyone else can as well. But they haven't. There is no one else who's I mean... come up with an explanation to explain image formation, carbon dating, and how the blood got under the shroud. Bob, if I could... Jordan, this is your section. Is it okay if I step in? I think I, I might It's your show, man. Do your thing. Okay, cool. No, I want to be fair to everyone. So, okay, last question. And then, um, so I think, uh, Bob, do you think that Jordan, what he calls conservative conservatism, uh, might be called the criterion of plausibility, right? So I think what Jordan is saying is like your hypothesis, uh, appealing to an unknown mechanism, which acts counter to known mechanisms or something like that, it lacks plausibility. It seems implausible. Um, now, if he's correct in that, do you think that would take away from the, you know, as a factor against the truth of a hypothesis or not? Well, for people who don't think straight, it would, yes. Now, for example, with the example of the airplane, it seemed implausible that an airplane could fly, but it does. I, 
Bob, I, I don't think you're. Maybe I'm just not explaining it very well. Uh, so, if you, I, I'm yeah. not saying that you, you, it cannot happen. I'm not. Obviously, general relativity is very counterintuitive, and yet it is true, or at least it's, we won't get into the details. It, it, it has. It is more true than Newtonian physics, and so. But the reason we can accept that is because it came with a commensurately massive amount of observations and evidence yeah. to support it, right? Had there mm -hmm. not been this massive body of evidence, we wouldn't have accepted general relativity because it ran counter to all of the other things we thought we knew, right? Mm -hmm. Likewise, your hypothesis requires us to accept that there is previously unknown physics. That is not impossible. New physics has been discovered. However, if you want us to accept that our picture of the universe is fundamentally different, like it should be this way, we think it's this way, we have all this evidence for this way, but it should be this other way, I don't think it's unreasonable to expect that you would give us way more evidence than Joe would require for something that just requires something that's completely mundane that we know could happen. Perhaps it happened better than it ever happened before, but it is perfectly in line with everything we know to be true. I don't see how you could reasonably reject that. Okay, so I'll let Bob yeah. respond, and then I want to go to Michael, Michael yeah. after this. My, my answer is my predictions that I make. We need to test them, okay? We simply need to test them. Now, the, ba the basic question here is, uh, is the Shroud of Turin the burial cloth of Jesus, and is it evidence for his resurrection? Now, now, if I just take my science hat off and I put my Christian believer's hat on and think biblically, uh, according to John chapter 20, uh, wh where John said, I saw and believed. He saw the burial cloth in a collapsed configuration. That's the only explanation we have. So that the body disappeared from within the, the, the cloth wrapping around his body. Now for that to happen, the electrons have to disappear. The nuclei, including the protons and neutrons, have to disappear so that the resurrection of, of Jesus logically is a nuclear event, okay? So that if you start from that perspective, then my hypothesis falls into very good correlation with all of the bi biblical evidence for an historical event. Okay, so I would offer that as a correlative value. But I don't like to make that argument because I like to make it purely from a scientific perspective. And there is only one explanation that actually works for, for the discoloration on the fibers. Now, the fi a fiber from the flax plant that makes up uh, the linen on the shroud is just one-fifth the diameter of a human hair, 15, 15 to 20 uh, micrometers or microns. It's sometimes abbreviated. But the discoloration level is just less than 0.2 micrometers all the way around the circumference. If you are given that uh, uh, as a project, you were assigned that in, in, in your master's or doctoral dissertation as a project to solve that problem. How in the world would, would you create a discoloration that is that thin uh, all around just the circumference of the fiber? How would you do that? Okay, I thought on this for weeks and I finally came up with a way that that could be done. And, and that's, you can look this up uh, on Wikipedia, it, it's called uh, skin effect of an alternating current. Skin effect of an alternating current. This is the only possibility that I could think of. Therefore, I'm just following the evidence logically. That's what I'm doing. I'm not taking the Bible as some, somehow, somehow confining my, my uh, argumentation. I'm arguing from the science of it that once we've realized that the discoloration is so extremely thin around the circumference of the fiber, the only option, you can suggest something else. The only one that I could think of after weeks of trying to solve this problem was a skin effect of an alternating current. Now, what that means is that in an alternating current, the electrons are going back and forth, creating and, and destroying uh, electric and magnetic fields, which force the electron flow to the outer perimeter of the conductor exactly where the fiber is discolored. So that if the frequency is high enough, it, it would restrict that electron flow to that less than 0.2 micrometers 
of the fiber. The electrons would bump into the atoms, thus making them move more rapidly, which is heat. That heat would then uh, discolor the fibers as in a scorch, creating the exact color of a scorch, which is exactly what the, the discoloration on the shroud is. So that you, you logically go back step by step. And, and in my paper 34, uh, I discuss this extensively uh, and show how going back about six or seven different levels, uh, and you end up with a conclusion that most likely what happened uh, was that the nuclei in the body, in the body, were probably, now this is speculative, but this is my speculation informing my hypothesis. Every hypothesis is speculative to some extent. So that I think that that, that alternating current would ultimately be formed by a, a vertical oscillation of the nuclei in the body, vertical relative to the horizontal body, because that's what the evidence indicates. Uh, and that would then cause the alternating current in the fibers, which caused the discoloration, which caused the image. Now, if there's some other hypothesis that actually works and actually explains, rather than just in a hand-waving fashion, how that extremely thin discoloration on the fibers was formed, that then, uh, you know, that, that's good. And then we would await uh, experimentation on the predictions. And that's how science is done. Gotcha. Awesome. All right, cool. Thanks. So I want, Michael, um, you've been sitting there patiently. So I, I want to turn it to you to now initiate. Uh, is there anything about the, the carbon dating and the openings you heard that you want to engage with and have an informal discussion on? Yeah. <clears throat> I, Jordan, I'd just like to ask you a, a little bit more about um, <clears throat> what you were talking about earlier, about the cleaning procedures that uh, Oxford uh, used compared to Zurich and Arizona. And I think what you were suggesting was that um, because their cleaning re regime was different, that they would have removed some contaminants that perhaps Zurich and Arizona hadn't removed. Could you just explain that a little bit more and what those contaminants were or what you believe they may have been? Sure. So uh, I didn't come up with this idea myself. Um, I pulled it from Walsh and Schwab 2019 um, and Lazaro et al. in 2020, if other people want to look at someone more intelligent than myself, explain it. Uh, but basically the idea is that um, there is a demand. So the three labs did not have the same cleaning procedures as you mentioned. There's a there's one specific kind of difference that a petroleum ether that Oxford used, the other two did not. Yeah. Um, and there are classes of contamination, uh, like hydrocarbons, lipids, like wax or fat or grease, um, that are better cleaned by petroleum ether than are cleaned by the procedures that Zurich and Arizona did. And these are the kind of contaminants that um, we know can exist on the shroud elsewhere. Don't know if they were right there, right? But they could be there. Um, and so the argument goes that if this petroleum ether, ether was only very slightly better at cleaning than the other two labs, because they, they do not, the, the dates don't line up, but they aren't like it's not like one was hundreds of years away, right? You only need a shift of, I think they say 10 years to make the statistical anomalies go away. Um, I'm quoting off memory, so I could get that number wrong, but it was small. Uh, and so is that, now the question is, is that real? Did, is that contamination actually there? The answer is, I don't know. I, I, it's This is a, a thing I have to posit in order for that um, hypothesis to work, which is testable. I mean, we could look at Arizona sample, for example, and see if it has the kind of stuff that petroleum ether would clean. Yeah, I mean, the, the Oxford result was significantly different to the Arizona result and the Zurich result. It wasn't just 10 years, it was it was well, uh, 100 years in the case of Arizona, 70 so, odd years in the case uh, of Zurich. Sorry, sorry, I interrupted you there. That was rude. No, no, sorry. Um, so I don't mean that if you shifted it 10 years, suddenly they would be like right in line with each other. That's, that's no, no, like, sure. Yeah, uh, I mean that uh, the... the, the the fact that they're not homogenous, if you shifted them by 10 years, then they would become homogenous in a statistical sense. Uh, they wouldn't agree completely because no results are ever going to agree completely. And I, I can't tell you the math because I didn't do the math. I'm quoting Walsh and Schwalt on that. Right. Okay. Because certainly to, uh, to get them to be um, more or less in alignment, to get Oxford's result nearer the 
uh, nearer the Zurich result, you would have to shift a heck of a lot of contaminant. I, I don't know exactly how much you'd need to get them perfectly in line. I'm not too worried about getting them perfectly in line because, again, my my concern is not like I totally agree. You can't use the radiocarbon dating to say whether it's 1260 or 1390 or 1100 or 1400. Like, well, it's not 1400. We have clearly it's not that, but you, you get what I'm saying. I don't think that this dating, because of all the problems with it, um, is reliable to that degree. I wouldn't rely it on for that, but. Fortunately, that's not the question we're asking. We're not asking whether it was 1390 or 1380 or, you know, 1250 or whatever. We're asking, is it first century, yes or no? And so uh, I, I think because because that's the only question we're asking, things that would shift in a decade or even a century one way or the other are kind of, I mean, they're, they're good questions to ask, but they're not, they don't bear on that question. I, I mean, to be honest, I, I'm, I'm not sure that the question we're asking is, is it first century or not? As far as this discussion is concerned, I think it's more, is the carbon date invalid? Is, was the carbon test valid? And uh, I think there are some serious questions about that. There are some rather uh, strange anomalies that appear to take place in the uh, that, that were revealed by the, um, the the test report. And one of the things which I just cannot get to the bottom of at all is the delta thirteen C values that were quoted for Arizona. Zurich and uh, Oxford <clears throat> and the delta 13c values are really quite fundamental to the calculation of the carbon dates so for instance for Zurich and Arizona uh, I think there were 25 and uh, 25 uh, parts per million and uh, uh, 25.1 per mil I think I haven't got the values in front of me here um, for Oxford, it was calculated, the delta 13C value was calculated as 27, which is an unusually high value for linen. But it's also, what's even more unusual is it, it was measured not by the Oxford laboratory itself, it was measured by Harwell. And again, this I've, I've never seen an explanation as to why that was the case. But the impact of, well, first of all, I can't understand why, given that we're talking about adjacent samples from a very small piece of linen cloth, why we would have such a, a large difference between the Delta 13 C values for Oxford as compared to um, Zurich or, or Arizona. I'm not sure why that would be the case, but the impact of that difference is quite significant because it actually pushes the, um, by using a, a value of 27 in that calculation, as opposed to say 25, which is more typical and is also the values obtained by Zurich and Arizona. The value of 27 brought the calculation of the radiocarbon date 35 years nearer that of Zurich and Arizona. So it's really quite curious as to why why was it 27 instead of 25 as per the other values and also why did harwell test it why couldn't oxford provide that 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 value they had a, a mass spectrometer there why could they not calculate it themselves it's it's very very curious to me um and so i'm not sure that we're just talking about trying to get a a value uh, uh, a, uh, a ten-year difference in order to make them homogeneous. There's there's other questions to be asked here as well. I mean, I'm not saying those questions aren't worth asking, um, and I'm not going to defend the specific procedures that the different labs did. I don't think there's any question that they could have done their work better. Uh, they could have done different samples, for example. That would have been awesome. Um, so yeah, I, I don't think there's any question that they the tests were not run in an ideal manner. Um, the reason that I'm, I don't want to say not concerned because I think that's too flippant. Uh, the reason that that is not enough, the reason I wouldn't throw out the results as a basis of that, because to, to basically set them aside and say they don't have evidentiary weight is because just like what you said, if they had done 27 versus 25, that's a shift of 35 years. And while you could say 
well, because they didn't do this, they're not ideal tests or we can't use it. I, I don't think that the question I am interested in is do these tests point towards it being first century or not first century? That's the question I'm trying to answer. Um, it's not the only question to be answered, but that's the question. When I say that I rely on the radiocarbon dating, that's the question I'm relying on it. That That is the question. That is what I'm relying on it to answer. If that makes sense. Okay. Uh, Bob, I, I did see you raise your hand earlier to respond to Michael. Did, did you have something you wanted to say to, well, to Michael? Well, just, just in general here, we, we have the last four papers all concluded th that you cannot conclude that we know anything about the true date of the shroud from the carbon dating experiments because the data is heterogeneous. That, that means that the different samples were essentially different from each other. So that they weren't just measuring the actual date of the shroud. There was other things that it was measuring as well. Uh, and that's exactly what I'm saying, that they were also measuring the amount of carbon, new carbon-14 produced by neutron absorption. Now, so we have five things that have to be explained here when we start looking at, at the dates and carbon dating. We need to explain the average of, that was obtained of 1260 to 1390. Uh, we need to explain the uh, slope or gradient of, of the data. Uh, and I, I calculated about thir 36 years per centimeter, which would be 91 years per inch. So you, you take the sample point up 10 inches, you would add 910 years to 1260, and you're now in the future. So it's, it's very, very important. The, the third item that you need to be able to explain is how the 12 subsample dates uh, were obtained for each of the 12 subsamples. Now, I don't think that the invisible reweave concept can explain that. I believe that, that the neutron absorption concept can explain that uh, because we have two distributions going on. There's one distribution uh, along the center line of the body, but from the center line, uh, there's also a distribution. So that one distribution in the X direction along the center line of the body and one perpendicular to that uh, in the y direction. Uh, so, so that's the third item. The fourth item that has to be explained uh, is the carbon dating uh, of the Sudarium of Oviedo to about 700 uh, AD. Uh, the, and now there is a fifth item that I've just recently become aware of in, in thinking about this. Uh, and this is in reference to the paper that you quoted, uh, Schwabe and Walsh from uh, 2021. Uh, where, where they note the bifurcation of the dates. So that for both for Zurich uh, and for um, uh, Arizona, there was a bifurcation of the dates. That is, the dates are split into two different groupings uh, with the date uh, greater than 100 years different. Uh, and so that if you come up with an explanation, like uh, use your example, uh, of it's just being... Uh, different measurements due to uh, preservatives or contaminants and whatnot. You still have to explain why that would create a bifurcation of the dates. Now, if you take the neutron absorption hypothesis uh, with the dates being the result of the X and Y distribution of the neutrons in the tomb, then the bifurcation of the dates is very easily explained. Uh, and that is, that, that if, if the samples were cut, uh, if laid uh, along the x-axis and they were cut along the x-axis, then creating a, a one sample, uh, it would be higher on the y distribution of the neutron distribution and one lower, it automatically explains the bifurcation of the dates. And of course, uh, in, in the paper by Schwabe and Walsh, they had no idea what would cause it? So I am proposing a very simple uh, explanation based upon neutron absorption. Okay. Um, I guess just uh, following up on that before I go, uh, turn it over to Joe to initiate. Um, I'm just sort of curious. Uh, Jordan raised uh, an objection. I asked Tom about this, but it's, I'm not sure I understood it exactly. It was, you were, Jordan, you were talking about in the show how the there is this uh, distribution or slope of dates in the vertical direction, but it, it's not seen in the horizontal direction. And you you were saying that this is some, like an, uh, I thought you were saying this might be an objection to positing neutron 
absorption. Did, did I just totally misunderstand that or what's that? Um, about? <clears throat> so there is a slope in the vertical direction. Um, I'm not sure I put a ton of weight on that because it's a slope of three data points, two of which are kind of close to each other and one which is not. Um, that's not a robust set of put data points to drive a slope from. Mm -hmm. um, now, there's no slope in the horizontal direction, not too surprising because it's very thin. So even if there was a horizontal effect, you wouldn't expect to see, you wouldn't see much of it in the sample we have. Um, no, I think what you're referring to is what I was talk. Uh, I talked to, or I emailed Riani about it. Um, and in their paper, I, could, I yeah. can find the paper somewhere. Uh, basically, they did the, the paper where they um, were trying, I think it was the one where they, um, determined that Arizona hadn't dated their second sample, which was a surprise to many people, right? Uh, and so they were basically trying to simulate various configurations of the samples within each lab and trying to see which one accorded better with the data. Um, and so trying to figure out how they might have cut it, right? Uh, and the, the, the results that get a lot of the headlines is it showed this slope and there's a real effect of some sort between the different labs uh, that, that you're not heter they're not homogeneous and all that sort of stuff. That's the big headlines. But another result that he mentions is that they didn't find a statistically significant effect based on the configuration of subsamples within each lab. So whether Arizona cut it this way or this way or this way or whatever funky way they did, um, it that didn't have a statistically significant effect in their results. Um, I actually emailed Riani to make sure that I was reading it right, that I was interpreting it right. And uh, in the episode I did, episode one, I read exactly what Riani said. So I don't want to misquote him. I don't want to, he didn't like sign off on my episode or anything. But my understanding from his response is that what I just told you is accurate. Gotcha. Okay, cool. Oh, uh, Tom, yeah, hang on. Let me unmute you. And on that, I think that what we do know is that there was a uh, the trend where you look at uh, Oxford, Zurich, Arizona. There's a definite trend in that direction, which you call the Y direction. In the X direction, we really don't have any data. We have they, there was one. They did something like three hundred eighty-seven thousand different potential cuts. Yeah. Well, of those, all but one are hypothetical. So, you know, the one that actually exists, we don't know what it is. So we really don't know if there's a trend from their paper in the, that other direction, okay? Because uh, uh, of all the cases they did, they're just, uh, they're hypothetical. So you can't conclude that in that direction there is anything uh, statistics, or you can't conclude that there's no trend uh, in, in that direction. But we definitely can conclude that in the vertical direction, there is a trend. So I don't know if Jordan would like to comment on that, but I don't think that paper <laughs> demonstrates anything of actually what's there. Uh, they can conclude it statistically, but we don't know what the actual one cutting uh, pattern was uh, in, in, in that direction. So I agree that um, you can't, with the data we have, say anything about a horizontal trend because it's just a centimeter across. There's just not enough area. And not only it. that, there's only one. I mean, it's not 387,000, which is what they looked at. But in the other direction, you can conclude that there is a trend, even as you rearrange all of these samples. And it's a very significant trend, as Bob pointed out, 90 90 years per inch. I mean, that's enormous. As he said, if you go up one or 10 inches, it's 900 years. I mean, yeah, if you extend the trend, mm -hmm. I mean, sure. But mm -hmm. like, that doesn't mean that is actually the case. Like, just because you could do that doesn't right. mean it is the case, right? Uh, and so I don't dispute that if you plot the averages of the different labs and you draw a line, it makes a trend. Like, that's clear. We only showed that for sure. Like, I don't dispute that at all. But that's, that's, as my understanding of it, is if you, here's the average for one lab, here's the average for another lab, here's the average for this lab. If you draw a line, that's the 90 per inch, right? Uh, that's three data points. Getting a trend for three data points is not particularly impressive. Like, there almost no, there's only one configuration that you wouldn't get a trend, right? That's not a lot of data to, to like, pull a trend off of. And so while there is a trend between the labs, interlab, intralab, according to Riani at all, at least, there doesn't appear to be a spatial component, um, which at least is suggestive to me 
that uh, the problem is the differences between the labs and not necessarily the position. But I don't think you can say that for sure based on Riani's stuff. Yeah, whether there's a trend or not depends on the value of the of the uh, uh, significance level. Uh, and, and so they listed a value of four of five percent, which was just at the that, that that was the magic number, you might say. If if it was over five percent, then you would accept the data. If it was less than five percent, you'd re reject the data. But but when we take their means for the three different laboratories and redo the calculation, it's 4.18%. So 4.18 was rounded up to 5%. Uh, and then when we go back to the original data for the 12 subsamples uh, and calculate the significance level, it's it's 1.39%. So it's much lower. It's very significant. It's It's not adequate to just say that you only have three points and therefore you can't be sure what it is. Yes, you can be sure, because the significance level was calculated based on their data to be 1.4%, so that there, there is a, a slope to the data. Do you want me to okay. respond to that? Or? Yeah, I, yeah, I was... No, no. Uh, okay. okay. Yeah, I, I was trying to show the bifurcation here uh, of the data. So we have one line here, and then we have another line here so we have two values here two values here and then we have three values here and mm -hmm. two values here with a difference based upon this scale of over 100 uh, years difference and okay. so that that pattern has to be explained in some way and so it's easy to do with neutron absorption i've not heard of any other explanation for it all right, cool. So I, I do want to be fair, and I wanted to turn to Joe to initiate the next, uh, you know, fifteen or twenty minutes of discussion. What what's important to you on these carbon dating here? Um, okay, first of all, I wanted to uh, clarify something that Jordan said in terms of when he said uh, it would have been better if the scientists had taken more samples. That's always a point of confusion. I find um, the, the scientists may have expressed. Uh, how many samples they wanted or whatever, but it was Giovanni Rigi and Ganella who who uh, argued for an hour and a half on April 21st, 1928, where the sample would be taken, despite there had been a three-day uh, workshop in Turin in, in 1986 to determine that, but they apparently forgot all about that. And it was really, I guess, ultimately even Ganella over Rigi who um, who picked the spot. And um, interestingly, Rigi later wrote that he uh, uh, had to uh, excise foreign fibers from the sample that they did cut. So I just wanted to make the point that it was uh, basically Ganella that that decided to take one sample and the, the labs just dated um, what they were given. Um, and secondly, I also want to piggyback on something Michael said. Um, I agree with him that, that the question isn't so much is the Shroud uh, first century is, is uh, as to uh, whether the, the carbon data is even valid. And I keep on I'm, my harping point is that the test was so poorly done that the results really should, should not be considered a valid um data point. Um, and just to, to emphasize that, um, I, I'd like to read another um, uh, excerpt from a presentation that was made by a statistician at a, a conference in Rome in 1993. I was there in person. Uh, he's French. His name was Philippe Boursier de Carbone. His last name is spelled C-A-R-B-O-N, but pronounced Carbone. That's kind of kind of ironic, I think. But anyway, he listed 15 points of failure in the radiocarbon test. And I want to read those because I, I think they're significant. Uh, they're pretty significant. And um, I'll just read them. One, absence of a formal report of the sampling. Two, absence of a video archive on the final steps of the samples packaging. They had like 16 depending on who you talk to, 11 to 16 hours of video of the sampling. But the one thing they didn't 
video was the putting into the containers. That's that's a little suspicious. Uh, three, in the official reports, contradictions about the cutting and the weight of the samples by people in charge of sampling. They couldn't get their story straight on how much they weighed and how big they were. I mean, this is, come on, folks, this is just basic science. Get good measurements. And they couldn't even get the weights and the, the sizes right. Four, breaches of the protocols initially planned for the operation of dating. Multiple protocol deviations. Um, five, rejection of the usual procedure of double-blind test. Six, refusal of the interdisciplinary documentation, which is usual in the procedures for radiocarbon dating. Seven, exclusion of acknowledged specialists in the shroud, particularly American scientists who participated in previous works of STIRP. STIRP knew the most about the shroud. The C-14 scientists basically didn't know much at all about the shroud. And then even some of the Italian scientists that uh, there was a textile expert named Giorgio Test, uh, Testor, or Test, Franco Testori, sorry. Um, and he pointed to the wound in the side and he said, what's that? He didn't even know that that was blood from the side wound. Um, seven, or I'm sorry, uh, eight, communication to the laboratories, most unusual, of the dates of the control samples prior to testing. Michael already mentioned that. That is just mind boggling that you would give the labs the dates of the control sample. That puts it open to big exactly. manipulation. And yeah. It's terrible. Um, nine, intercommunication of results among the three laboratories during the job. They were not supposed to, to consult with one another and they did multiple times. 10, disclosure to the media of the first results before the delivering of the findings. 11, refusal to publish raw results of the measurements, uh, which was requested as early as 1989. Uh, I heard one skeptic who went to the British Museum recently said, oh, well, nobody, they gave it to the, the information to me when I asked them. The reason they didn't give it before was that nobody asked them. No. <laughs> They were asked multiple times. And of course, now we know that it, they did release the data, but only because of the Freedom Information Act. It's, it's normal during a scientific experiment, after an experiment, to release the raw data. They wouldn't until they were forced to. That's also very, very suspicious. 12, non-explanation of the unique isolation of the confidence interval of the measures performed by the Oxford laboratory compared to those made by other laboratories. So 13. Just, just so I know, are, are you, who are, are you addressing here? Are you asking someone, someone about this or are you just, are you just like uh, making a statement or something or? I'm just reading these 15 points just to okay. em emphasize my point that it was poorly done. And it, it because of that, the, the test really cannot be considered a valid uh, gotcha. data point. Gotcha. Okay. All right. 13, unacceptable value of 6.4 published in the journal Nature for the chi-squared statistical test on the results of the radiocarbon dosage on the shroud. Another statistical test that the, the results failed. 14, rejection of any cross-debate on the statistical measures performed. Uh, originally, it was supposed to... Um, the results were supposed to have been sent to the Colonati Institute in Turin. They weren't, they, uh, they never were. Another protocol breach. 15, reje rejection, absolutely uncommon, of the publication of the statistical expertise of this operation officially entrusted to Professor Bray of G. Colonetti Institute of Turin. And that was also requested um, at the Paris Symposium in 1989. And Bursay de Carbone concluded, such a remark of deficiencies remains completely unusual in the context of a truly scientific debate. And one can only deplore this exception to the usual um, ethics, end quote. So, um, you know, I think in both with Bob's theory and my theory or hypothesis, uh, we both believe that the results might be fairly accurate in terms of the piece they were given. 
However, I just because of that doesn't I, I I don't believe you can count on that as a valid uh, measure of the actual date. It has led to Bob doing his hypothesis, me and my late wife doing our hypothesis. So I think the only uh, a benefit of the the poor methodology uh, of the C14 labs is that it led it indirectly led or directly whatever you want to say led to further research. Um, so again, I think bottom line for me is that um, the the C14 results as as validly measuring the actual calendar date of the shroud itself is, is is something that basically should be thrown out. Awesome. So, yeah. Does anyone want to respond to that just before we go to the to Tom? Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, Joe, could you make that available? Uh, may, maybe through Dale. Uh, yeah, he's gonna, uh, I already sent it to him. He's going to have it on his blog. Okay. Good. Thank you. So. I would just say that um, if you say something's valid or invalid, uh, I think that only makes sense in the context of what it's valid or invalid for. Like, for what purpose is it invalid or invalid? Um, and so, like, a tool might be, or a measurement, I don't know, if I use a meter stick and I'm measuring something, it's valid to tell me how many meters it is. It's invalid to tell me how many microns it is, right? So uh, it could be that this measurement would be invalid or not useful at all to tell you like where in the Middle Ages this thing was made. I'd agree with that. That does It doesn't follow that it's not valid to tell you whether or not the thing is likely for a century, if it points away from that. I, I know I keep pointing this point, but I, I don't think you can just say blanket, it's invalid, period, unless you say what it's invalid for. And I'm not, even with all the problems, I don't know yeah. that we can say that definitively it tells us nothing about how much radiocarbon is there. And it sounded like you were saying you, despite everything else you said, you think that they, they more or less accurately measure the amount of carbon that is in the thing they were given, right? It's yeah. I if, if it happened that way, I think it's just by luck. But from a scientific <laughs> point of view, I mean, look what look what uh, Harbottle said. It, the results prove nothing. The way because of the that's mm -hmm. why peep that's why papers get retracted because their methodology is wrong and the, and their conclusions are wrong. Why doesn't that apply here? I think there are so many uh, papers that have been written about the results. Um, I've seen very few that suggest that um, there was a a one thousand or twelve twelve hundred year difference in the um, a, a twelve hundred year error in the measurements. I think all the papers that have been written that have analysed them um, have come to the conclusion that there is a systematic error in the measurements. Yes. And that systematic error can only be due to contamination. And if there's contamination present, then that immediately invalidates the, the carbon dating. Yes, yeah. Yeah, so that every all four of these papers that, that were published in peer-reviewed journals, they all say that the carbon dates for the 12 subsamples are heterogeneous. Now, what that means is that they're, they, they're not dating the same thing. They're not measuring the same thing. It's like uh, you have multiple different pieces of cloth from who knows where, and you carbon date them, and you expect to uh, arrive by, by averaging the 12 different values at some kind of an average value. Well, that's nuts. Uh, and so that when they use the word heterogeneous or non-homogeneous, what it means is, is that the data is meaningless and must be rejected, makes no, re makes no reference to the true date of the shroud. You can I'm make sorry. no reference to the, you can that's be, complete you, the only thing you can do is totally reject it. That's complete nonsense. You, you can't, 
It yeah. being heterogeneous yeah, no. means that you cannot just simply combine. There is some kind of effect. That's what it's telling you, right? It is disingenuous to suggest it is equivalent to taking 12 random pieces of cloth and dating it as if you get the same thing. That's, that's exactly what heterogeneous means. That's just nonsense, man. Like that's no, not what happened. You don't and... have the back, you don't have the background, you don't have the experience to even well, understand what I'm saying. Okay, Bob. I yeah. know that you're the world's best nuclear engineer. I get but, it. Just, we can but, leave our personal objections uh, to the side. Yeah. Where did I'm you go? Saying, what university? Start. What university did you go to to get a degree in nuclear engineering? Bob Rucker, as I explained at the beginning of this episode, which you would have heard, heard if you were here on time, I went to Virginia Commonwealth University. I graduated. I couldn't remember if it was 2018 or 2019. I graduated one of those places. I got a 3.95 in my classes. I got an A in every single nuclear engineering class. I got a B in thermal systems design because a professor didn't like my project. I graduated with the highest honors I could have gotten at that class, and the, the degree is ABET accredited as mechanical and nuclear engineering degree. If you don't like my degree, talk to ABET. It's not my problem. I, I'm, so, I'm so, I, have prob I have a problem with your thinking. Well, you, you don't know what a systematic I'm error means. I'm, gonna, I'm not so, going to engage in our personal disputes. I'm only going to talk about the evidence, and I'm saying that I don't dispute that there is a systematic error. I don't dispute any of that. Okay, what I am a, saying a, a systematic is, error can okay. be uh, okay so I'm, I am going to step in as well I'm going to get a any step. amount I think we system, I think we understand the systematic error could be 10,000 years off yeah yeah I think we so I think we understand the difference okay great okay so but I do want to be fair cuz um Tom's been waiting and so I, he needs a a turn to kind of initiate uh the conversation so let me unmute you Tom and yeah, All right, let me let me take just a little different tack, uh, and I've got a question for jo uh, for Jordan, <clears throat> and it, the question is, how would he explain uh, all of the other information that's out there about the shroud? And uh, what I'm getting at here is uh, a combination of dating information. All right, all right. I, I, I'm sorry to interrupt. My my headphones came unplugged, and I didn't hear what you said. You said okay. I have a question for Jordan. I didn't hear after that. Right. Please repeat and yourself. I'm sorry. I, I I would like to hear your explanation of some of the other material that's been out there that's been published, and it's a combination of dating uh, approaches as well as as other things. So, for example, Giulio Fonte and I think it was 2013, published three different methods of dating fabrics, okay? Two was spectroscopic, uh, and one was a mechanical testing uh, that he did. He actually did it on the shroud. He had fibers of the shroud that he tested. And his results are showing that the shroud is dating to Christ's time. And then just recently, uh, he and collaborators published a paper on wide angle X-ray diffraction uh, that they applied to, uh, you know, about a dozen different uh, samples. And then that dated the shroud to the first century. Okay. So those are alternative dating methods for fabrics. And they're all saying first century. And then you've got, he wrote a whole book on, uh, numismatic uh, uh, methods where you can look at the images on coins and how they changed. Uh, and you've got people that have studied the botany. And then recently, uh, Joe Marino re released a, uh, a thing that Bill Meacham did uh, where he was using mass spectroscopy to show that uh, the shroud, uh, and he tested a, 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 fab or a, a fiber from the shroud, and showed that it's likely coming from Israel, that he, the mass spec, he had a delta H uh, and a delta oxygen uh, measurement that was made, that, and he could show the location where the, uh, the fabric was coming from, Egypt, Europe, uh, Israel. So how would you explain all of this other data if indeed the shroud is a medieval uh, forgery that, uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff that you'd have to explain in the other direction. Uh, okay, so I'll start from the top uh, and let me know if I missed something. So you had three other alternative dating methods. There's the mechanical, spectroscopic, and the waxes method, right? Um, right. Now, I'm most familiar with the waxes because um, I looked into that and someone sent it to me. Uh, I don't off the top of my head remember the papers for the other two, but... Uh, 
with the waxes at least, it the way I would explain that basically is that that's an interesting result. It's an interesting method. To the best of my knowledge, and I'm not an expert in this field, maybe more people have looked into it since I looked, but to the best of my knowledge, this method, it, he came up with it. Is that correct? He, he's like pioneering this method. Well, um, he has a collaborated or several on the paper and uh, they came up with it. Yeah, sorry. I did, when I said him, I didn't mean just Fanti. I meant everyone on the paper. I didn't give them credit too. Um, I don't think I'm equipped to assess the, the, the applicability of this new method. I'm not, that's well outside my field. Um, and to the best of my knowledge, I don't think his method has gained wide acceptance among other, among his peers. It did pass peer review. Uh, but if I'm given, um, this brand new novel method to testing and it's been used on the shroud, that's great. And once it's accepted, in the field elsewhere, other researchers have done it. They've found the limitations. They found the the little things you have to do to the like the problems with it. Um, if, if it gains that kind of acceptance, then I think it'd be worth revisiting. Um, at that point, like that would be solid evidence. Uh, so the way I would explain this, I don't, I don't think I need to explain it yet. It's an interesting line of inquiry, but I don't think it rises to the point where I'm too worried about it. Um, with the numismatic methods, uh, that's the image thing. Um, I am not personally persuaded that there is this clear indication that the shroud had a big impact on history. Um, I, I, I'm just not convinced that that is the case. I don't think I, I, I can see what people are saying, uh, but I don't think it's I don't th find that that evidence particularly strong. Um, the botany thing, uh, the pollen, I, th I we talked about it with Hugh, so maybe Hugh remembers. He's in the comments or in the side chat. Um, I don't think you can use pollen to say what region it came from. The kind of pollen that's there um, is, there are similar species across Europe and North Africa and the Middle East. And so from my understanding from the papers on botany I've read, uh, you can't get down to the species level with most kinds of pollen. So I think that would be inconclusive. Um, the Delta H and Delta O, I don't know that I'm familiar with that one. Yeah, that just came out. Joe just released that. It was actually a paper that was done in the eighties and then they abandoned it. <clears throat> the idea once the radiocarbon dating came out and uh, Meacham just went back and he redid the study and he's uh, basically uh, in fact I have I have a uh, a slide on that, that you said it was Meacham to... yeah okay and that just yeah. came out uh, if, if you yep. can um, actually if you can get with Dale and get that paper I'm always interested to hear new evidence so I just have never seen this so I don't want to opine on something I've never seen hang on a minute I'll see if I can share my screen again and I can perhaps show you what that looks like yep if I can. Uh, oh, just go to your fly I'll bring it up once you're off let's see here I have to go back there you go uh, this is uh, I <clears throat> this was taken from the report that uh, Joe put out and it's a mass spec analysis, uh, delta hydrogen and uh, delta oxygen 18. And he's able to see which regions uh, <clears throat> these various samples came from. So the, the blue is Egypt. Uh, the, the colored area would be from Israel. There were two outliers. Uh, the uh, gold is from Europe. And the shroud is the green. And it's inside the... Uh, the area from Israel. So again, this is not going to, you know, prove that. Uh, uh, let me get rid of this. Okay. Me... Am I back in or? <laughs> yeah. Um, there you go. Uh, it's not going to, you know, it's not going to prove the radiocarbon date. But what my point is that there is a there have been a tremendous amount of studies done, uh, and the, one of the advantages of the uh, uh, radiocarbon dating work was that it it's it spawned all of these studies to look at alternative dating methods and, and, and everything else. So it may be a blessing in disguise. And these are all pointing to the shroud being authentic. So somebody that just says, well, it's a medieval forgery, I think has a heck of a lot of things to explain uh, in these other uh, from these other studies that have been done. Can I, can I step in just a couple quick questions? And I'm, I'm going to do it on both sides here. So uh, just for you, Jordan, one thing that I think is interesting that was presented here is uh, Tom's findings with the ultraviolet fluorescence intensity, because that's supposedly independent collaboration of Bob Rucker's neutron MCNP calculations. So 
Uh, do you, what's your take on the UV fluorescence? Have you studied that at all? Do you think that's good evidence? Like, what's your take? Um, I read those papers for the first time last night and this morning, so I do have thoughts. But uh, probably Tom should probably like explain what it is we're talking about because not everybody in the chat or on the video spends their hours reading Shroud of Terror papers. <laughs> <laughs> true. I'm trying to get that changed. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I might, I might just add that that one paper that's uh, in the International Journal of Archaeology has been read almost 2,500 times now. I checked yesterday. It's 2,400 and maybe 60. And, uh, and it's, it's, it's just interesting that uh, I independently looked at the, the fluorescence intensity. I had interacted with Bob uh, and was aware of his simulation work. But one of the things that came out of that you know, when I saw the patterns that agreed with one another is, gee, maybe it makes sense to see if neutron radiation affects linen. And sure enough, it affects the fluorescence intensity of linen. So that's kind of like a, a testifiable, uh, a testable, I should say, uh, idea that, that came out of that research and, uh, uh, and did, uh, did uh, connect the two together. So... Now, Tom, I, I want to kind of push back on you. So I'm going to be asking a shroud skeptics because I've seen Hugh Ferry. He's kind of written about these UV findings and um, his objection is kind of saying that, well, you found the UV photos all overlap, but their colors do not. And he's, he's saying this means that each strip was processed differently and it is not possible to compare their brightness. Um, so the fact that the strip from nearest to the wall is bright and also Bob's radiation hypothesis corresponds to that. I think he's going to say is not, it, it doesn't prove any kind of correlation. Like, I, I haven't seen his uh, critique of that. And when he says process differently, what does he mean? Do you know? Uh, not, not offhand. He's, uh, he's writing it in, in the chat. Because I saw him, he just wrote it on a, an internet comment uh, kind of thing. And I couldn't find it, but... Yeah, he, I just wanted to get your take if you knew about that. Yeah, I think I think that Miller was a, one heck of a photographer. They had quite a photography team. Barry Schwartz was involved with it, and uh, they were pretty careful in terms of uh, uh, what they were doing. And I've gone back and I've looked at uh, their original paper, which was published in 1981, and I made the same plot from the graphs that they published where I could... Uh, uh, copy them from the paper and analyze them. I get the same trend. I, I get that double maxima, uh, which is given in the, in the paper, as well as from the, uh, from the uh, images that were put on the web in 2019. So I'm not sure what you was getting at. So yeah, he, I'd like to see, I'd like to see his comments. Yeah, he's, he's saying he'll write another blog on it. So I'll, I'll send that to you kind of thing. And then okay. response and I'll post it on my blog for people. Um, uh, sure. Okay, um, so one last question. This is for Joe. Uh, well, hold just, on. Tom, I think, was asking me to opine on that. At oh, least sure. I think so. I don't want to dominate the show. But, yeah. um, of course, you guys are the guests, so go ahead. Um, okay, so like I said, I read the, the papers she put out last night and this morning, because I read the, the earlier one uh, and then didn't realize that uh, there was a later one that where you'd done the neutron irradiation. Um, so I haven't looked into it in detail, so I'm, there may be more questions that I would come up with later. Um, I think, in fact, it's funny because I was reading the first one and the, the through line of that was, um, uh, if UV radiation, if UV fluorescence can be affected by neutron radiation, then this. And I was like, well, can it? I don't know. Like, and it seemed like the paper didn't know either. Uh, and I was like, oh, that would be interesting. And then sure enough, you did it and it appeared to, and I, assuming the paper's, uh, good, I mean... It would be just it would be bad skepticism for me to say that that was not some level of evidence. I mean, if but what when I say something is evidence, I mean that uh, the hypothesis is more likely to be true given that observation than it otherwise would be, right? And evidence is symmetrical if something is evidence for, not seeing as evidence against, right? And so having those two things match and neutrons being able to cause UV fluorescence, I think it's fair to say is evidence for Bob's hypothesis. Um, now, there's other things that should be explored, of course, as you mentioned in your paper. Um, aging, what, what they did like a force aging process and that also influenced UV fluorescence. So there could be some aging effect. Um, it could also be, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Bob, but your hypothesis basically has the neutron radiation coming uh, 
evenly, like that the density is the same everywhere, every cubic centimeter of the body. Um, and so like, so it's more in the center than in the edge. And so I'm just spitballing, perhaps there's some kind of shared, um, so, so your U fluorescence also has things more in the center where there's more fabric than the edge. And so is there some other effect through aging or heating or something that would affect things in the center more than the edge? I don't know. These are the kinds of questions I'd want to explore, but I haven't explored them. So I guess my take would be, it's very interesting. Uh, it's great that you did the follow-up on the neutron irradiation. I think it's fair to say that's evidence for Bob's hypothesis. Not conclusive, certainly, uh, but it's something worth investigating. Awesome. All right, cool. Well, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to our final panelist, Bob Rucker, to kind of initiate, uh, you know, what, what do you want to talk with, about with the other panelists? Uh, yes, I'd like to go back to the issue of uh, systematic error. Uh, that, so that we we have uh, the four different papers, and, and uh, which all indicate that the data is heterogeneous. I heard Jer Jordan say that he still believes that it's basically true, even though I believe he admits that but that there is a systematic error. Now, when when I refer to a systematic error, uh, the magnitude of a systematic error uh, in general cannot be determined. Uh, so I have no way of determining once the systematic error is proven, and I believe you agree that there is a systematic error, that once, once you prove that there is a systematic error, that the significance level is less than 5%, uh, then, then the question is, can you determine what the magnitude of the systematic error is? So Jordan, I'd like to ask you that. You still believe the carbon dating, even though there's a systematic error uh, in the measurements. Therefore, I ask you, how do you determine what the magnitude is of the systematic error? So the way I'm looking at it is a small systematic error is more likely than a big one. Uh, the, 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 Say that again? Things that would influence, uh, things that would change the dating of the measurements by a small amount seem there are more of those than would influence it by a large amount. Um, and so the the level of error that would be required in order to make this thing not to get the observations we see from a first century class seem to be quite large. Whereas the amount of things that the mayor you need to make a heterogeneous, but not first century, that probability space seems to be, it takes up more of the probability space is the way I think about it. Um, I can't say that with certainty. I don't think you can use this uh, carbon dating to say with certainty, but correct me if I'm wrong, your entire hypothesis relies on the carbon dating being more or less accurate. Does it not? Like, they, they, not they, what, what I, and I believe Joe Marino believe, is that the measurements were done accurately, but okay. the interpretation of the, of the ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12 was inaccurately interpreted. Okay, well, then this whole discussion is it, that that whole like thing is a sideshow. Like, okay, I can grant you all of that, and that still you believe through all of that, that the, the actual ages are more or less accurate to the thing they were given. You disagree with their interpretation. No, that's no, no, you're mis no, I'm sorry, you're misinterpreting me. What I said was that the measurements of the carbon-14 to the carbon-12 ratios were accurately done. Okay. When you, go, you, you then have to use an equation to go from that, from that ratio to a date. And that equation depends upon the, the carbon-14 to carbon-12 ratio only changing due to the, the decay of the carbon-14. If anything else changes that ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12, that equation is no longer valid. And that's what I'm saying. The measurements of the carbon-14 to carbon-12 ratios were accurate, but the calculation of the date used a, an equation that did not apply. Okay, that's basically what I was trying to say. So okay. uh, let me let me rephrase it to make sure I understand. Uh, and they'll just think I understand. Um, yeah. So when I say the measurements, you agree the measurements are more or less accurate. I'm talking about that ratio that the, then they then convert into a date. Obviously, radiocarbon yeah. doesn't come up with like the carbon atoms don't tell you how long they've been around, right? Uh, so <clears throat> that measurement of that ratio, which they then use a calculation with some interpretations and assumptions to get a date, that measurement you agree is accurate. I, I have no objection to that. They were professionals. I believe that the equi the equipment was operating correctly, that the procedures were correct, and the, and the materials, if any chemistry was being done, were correct. And that judgment is based upon the accuracy uh, of the calculation of the control standards. So based upon the accuracy of their uh, 
uh, determination of the dates, accurate dates of the control standards. Therefore, we can, can conclude that the carbon-14 to carbon-12 ratio were, was accurately calculated at the three laboratories. Okay, then I'm not sure what relevance the other stuff you were talking about has. Yes. To, to, just, to the question of whether or not it's first century. Obviously, it's very relevant to the quality of the data, whether it's like... Yes. It has so relevance so the, the equation uh, to calculate the date from the carbon-14 to carbon-12 ratio was evidently correct for the three control standards, but it was not correct for the shroud because it was there was uh, the carbon-14 to carbon-12 ratio was changed either by new carbon-14 being introduced, if I'm right, uh, or if a, a different carbon-14 to carbon-12 ratio was introduced in, into the fabric, if Joe Marino is correct. Right. Okay. I, I, I agree with all of that. Yeah. So my, my conclusion here, uh, again, uh, is that the dates published uh, in this document by, by uh, Damon are, is not correct uh, because the equations did not apply. So what I'm okay. saying is that, so the observation we have is this observation of the ratio of the measurements, right? Yes. And it seems like what we need to do, if we, so if we wish to have an explanation that we want to go with, then we should pick an explanation that explains that thing as parsimoniously as possible. Um, now your explanation- you, you brought in par parsimoniously, right? Right. Sim uh, without this, yeah, without no, ex extra no, hypotheses we don't need that explains all the data that yeah. like use whatever word you want, Bob. The best, yeah, the bestest ever, the one that gets blue ribbon, the one that won at the fair, whatever. Pick your label. Well, I don't care. I'm just yeah. saying we want the best explanation, and that ex you have an explanation of neutron radiation. Joe has an explanation of reweave, uh, and so uh, the whole discussion over whether the labs did the best that could have been done. It's a fruitful discussion to have, but I don't think it actually bears on the actual question of whether or not this thing touched Jesus. <laughs> All right. For... So, the, the, yes, if parsimonious uh, is an issue of simplicity. That's a third level criteria, uh, well behind the issue of does it agree with the evidence and does it make predictions that are testable and when tested prove that the, the predictions are true. Those are the two main criteria. The third level criteria uh, would be simplicity, parsimonious uh, issue, uh, or wh whether there are m multiple different mysteries that are solved by the hypothesis. Those are third level criteria. Okay. All right, cool. So I think that, that covers everyone's had their turn to kind of initiate the conversation. Um, before I go to my own questions and perhaps audience questions, is there anything that I missed? Is there anything that you know, one or more of the panelists feel needs to be discussed that wasn't brought up that we missed, or do we? Do you think we kind of covered it? What do you guys think? I got my main question answered, which is what to call you folks. So that's all I wanted. <laughs> Fair enough, Joe. Uh, Joe, you're muted. Sorry. You okay. Like... So, yeah, I forgot. Um, did you um, or, or do you, would you put Meacham's full press release that I had sent to the Shroud Science Group? Can you put that? as one of the documents on the blog. Absolutely. Uh, yep. Yeah, Jordan wanted to see that, and I think other people would like to see that too. Gotcha. Yep, I'll put that up for sure. All right, and everyone else is good. All right, cool. So let's go to questions. So I have a, a couple questions of my own um, that I wanted to ask. So uh, it, this is open to whoever, whoever wants to answer it. But this one comes from Julio Fonte, and it was really important for him to hear because he also thinks he has an independent proof of the neutron irradiation hypothesis. So he's studied the blood and there's a, a, an anomaly found in it where there's a extremely low levels of nitrogen. And he's, he's scientifically proven that a, an explanation for that could be if, the, if it was neutron irradiated, that would create that effect. Um, so I just wanted to turn it to you guys. What what do you guys think of that? Do is that a good, potentially good way of independently confirming the neutron flux hypothesis? Um, does it fail? Is there more studies that's needed? What What are your guys' thoughts on Fonte's blood studies there? Uh, my, my opinion uh, is that the uh, if it was true that the amount of 
trace amount of nitrogen-14 in the shroud was entirely consumed by neutron absorption, it would create far too much new carbon-14, inconsistent uh, with the carbon dating that was done in 1988. Um, be because you can, you can sh all that's needed uh, to shift the carbon date, for example, from 33 AD, the good date for the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, up to 1325, the midpoint of 1260 to uh, 1390. To, to shift the carbon date that amount only requires the carbon-14 uh, concentration to increase by 16.9%. And, and that would be accomplished by splitting of only 0.0004% of the deuterium nuclei that are in the body. Um, I'll just say, uh, I haven't, I'm saying this a lot, but I haven't had time to like go through that paper in detail. I have read it. Um, my intuition was the same as what Bob said. It seems like if they completely depleted the new, the nitrogen that was present, that would be a lot of carbon 14. Uh, I haven't done the math, but that's my gut instinct. Um, so, uh, I'd want to do that math to make sure that it accords well. Um, and I'd also, so anytime I'm looking at a paper like this, I'm always thinking of like, what are the alternative explanations that might be, you know, better or whatever. Uh, so for instance, one question I had reading it uh, was whether um, the, 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 nit the spectral, for those who haven't read this paper, again, who don't spend their days and nights reading Shroud of Turn research, uh, there's like basically the spectral lines and more line means more stuff. And in a blood sample, there's a big line well, not big line, but, but more line, right? And in the blood on the turn, there was uh, there was no line. And the way they tested it, if I was reading it correctly, they had a sample of blood that they near the line for, for blood, right? And then they had a bloody like thread, thread that had blood on it. And then they tested that, right? So one question I had, which I haven't found the answer for, maybe there's a good answer, I don't know, is is the fact that it's that there's a thin coating of blood in the one uh, versus it being all blood in the other would that mess with the proportions of nitrogen? Would you actually expect to see the 10% nitrogen from a thin coating? Because a lot of that lines are going to be coming from the linen, right? Which doesn't have a lot of nitrogen in it. Um, I don't know the answer to that. There might be a perfectly valid answer. I just don't know it. Uh, I will say uh, one thing that I, one objection I thought was, okay, well, does old blood still have nitrogen in it? I don't know. Uh, but then I, I think probably because I actually learned that blood meal is used to put nitrogen in in the ground and if you like dehydrate it and grind it up it still has a bunch of nitrogen in it so i'm going to accept that anyway that's my rambling thoughts on it awesome. yeah yeah so that we're, we're talking about nitrogen in the linen fiber uh, linen fibers is, is what we're talking about uh, i thought it that, was in the blood no, it's in, it's in the fibers and and uh, when i talked with art lynn phd physics um who had done experiments on this he gave me a number of 650 parts per million by weight. Uh, and that is just a trace amount uh, of nitrogen because nitrogen is not in the chemical formula, for example, for cellulose or, hemi or hemicellulose. So there's only about 1%. If you look up composition of, of linen, there's about 1% that's just not listed. It's just unknown. It depends on various things. Well, that's that would be where the 1% uh, you know, uh, that would be where the 650 parts per million uh, of nitrogen would be located. I, th I thought Fonte's, it was an anomaly in the blood there, not the fire. But Michael, I saw you unmuted. So, yeah, did, did yeah, you want yeah, to? So, yeah, so I, I've been talking about production of new carbon-14 by neutron absorption on linen fibers, not in blood. Now, okay. Fonte might be talking about blood. I'm, I'm not sure. Michael, did you want to say something? Or? Oh, no, no, only that, uh, yeah, that paper is about blood, not the uh, not the nitrogen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Tom, you were saying something I saw. Go ahead. Yeah, I think he's definitely talking about blood, and I don't think he's published his latest results, though, still working on it. He has published papers on the lack of nitrogen, but I believe he, he is uh, definitely talking about blood, and, and he also still has you know samples from the shroud so be yeah. interesting to see what he comes up with awesome all right cool so 
Uh, just a couple more questions quickly. So, so this one comes from Pam Moon, and it was uh, something that I had never heard before. So I guess this is open uh, to the Pro Shroud guys. But she's she's asking about. Oops, what was? Hang on one second. Will I load that up? All right. So where's Pam? Okay. So uh, carbon dating and Freemasonry. So uh, she she's written a paper. Uh, talking about this connection to the Freemasons and how that's relevant to the carbon dating. Um, are, are any of you guys familiar with Pam Moon's argument on that front? You, you are, Michael? Yeah. I know a little bit about it. All right. What's your, yeah, what, what is that about and what's your take on that then? Well, it's uh, one of the uh, beliefs of, um, certain Freemasons is that the shroud was actually created when um, uh, Jacques de Molay was arrested by uh, King Philip of France and, uh, and that as part of the torture that he endured, he was crucified. Now, apparently that is a belief of many, uh, uh, many Freemasons and their belief is that the shroud is therefore a cloth of Jack de Molly. And of course, the arrest was in 1307, I think. So it would date to a, a similar period to the uh, yeah. date given by the radio carbon dating. Um, so that's that's one uh, one hype. It's not uh, Pam's belief, I've got to say. <laughs> it's not her hypothesis, but uh, it's something that Pam has found from uh, books she's written, that, uh, sorry, books she's read, that this is a, a, a fairly common belief among certain Freemasons. Awesome. Yeah, and uh, Cardinal Bellastrero in an interview, I think around 1998, said that he believed that the Freemasons were involved in the, somehow in the C-14 dating, or I guess it's, his uh, private secretary was in on the meeting, I think. It was a German magazine that I think interviewed the both of them. And uh, I think I might have reference to that in the book. I probably do, the C14 book. Awesome, all right, thank you guys. So my last question, and then we have three audience ones and then we'll be done, I promise. Uh, thank you guys for hanging in there with me. But okay, so my question, this is specifically about the invisible reweave hypothesis and it's, a falsification uh, that I've heard, Bob, Bob has raised this, for example, in the uh, discussion that uh, Bob and Joe Marino had on my show uh, a couple of years back when his book came out. Um, but it was about the horizontal stri striations going across the cloth and even in uh, even in the, the carbon uh, sample itself. Uh, and uh, even John Jackson, the, the head of the STIRP team, said that this represents... Uh, uh, absolute falsification that the invisible reweave is impossible because of this. So I just wanted to put it to, to Joe and the others on the panel. Do you, do you guys know what this is about and you know, what would be the explanation from the invisible pro invisible reweave mm. uh, side? Mm -hmm. How do you respond to that objection? Um, again, I, I just repeat my, what I said to Jordan earlier uh, that when it comes to the, the technical stuff like this, I, uh, I leave it to other experts because I'm just not qualified to really assess that. Um, I sure wish Ray Rogers was still around. He'd, he'd enjoy some of these discussions for sure. But, um, you know, I uh, at the end of my uh, most recent uh, carbon dating article on the reweave, um, I list all the, you know, like six STERP members thought there were there was a reweave I have four textile experts, archaeologists. Um, you know, it's just it's to me, it's just a combination of a, I've got a lot of independent experts saying there's the reweave, and of course, really the only the only way to solve this uh, for for good is to to do some more testing, and uh, we might have to we'll probably have to wait till the next pope comes along before we can actually do that. But I hate to see the church sit on this because it's, you know, I, I believe that the shroud belongs to the, to the world and not to the Catholic church, the mm -hmm. living, actually it's the living Pope's property, but Amen. Um, I think it needs more, more testing and, and hopefully in the future that'll happen. 
I just wanted to say uh, I completely empathize with Joe's response of like, I'm not a textile expert. In fact, uh, there's a running joke in my channel where I, I was considering making a shirt. It's like, I'm not a, and just like, like a list of all the stuff, biologists, paleontologists, all this stuff, you know, <laughs> I'm just some idiot on the internet. So. <laughs> awesome. Uh, any Anyone else have anything else to say on this specific issue or you think we've covered it? Yeah. Okay. All right, cool. I will move on. And we've got three audience questions from what I can tell here. So the first one is from Dion Sanchez, and this is, goes for anybody. Does anyone believe that a forger could rub material from Palestine onto the shroud? So I, I think this is in respect to the Bill Meacham study, maybe that that's what he's talking about. Um, yeah. What, what do you guys think about this? Is this, mm -hmm. if there is material from Palestine, would that prove that yeah, it's, it's been there, or could that be explained by some kind of later contamination? Um, yeah. I think the question to ask is why would they choose to do this? If we had a medieval forger who wanted mm. to create uh, a, a, uh, something that could uh, be presented as a relic and attract pilgrims to a particular church or cathedral, why would they go to that trouble when yeah. nobody in those ages would have been able to detect that material that come from Palestine, it doesn't, it, it's not something that anybody would have any reason to do. I'm inclined to agree. Like, uh, it's see, like, you can always think of an ex, like, could someone have done it? Sure. I mean, some could have done it, you know, totally. But like, it, it seems like it's certainly less likely than them not doing that. Right. And so mm -hmm. if you observed, uh, indicate like the thing being from Palestine, if it is an auth authentically Jesus burial shroud, you'd expect it from Palestine. That would be the expected result. And so anything that points towards that would be necessarily evidence for the hypothesis that it is authentic. Not necessarily conclusive evidence, but it would be evidence. And so, yeah, I think explanations like this, I mean, I, I wouldn't yeah. put much weight in them. You have to ask why why a forger would have would have done anything as elaborate as we have on the shroud. You know, in those days, you could he could have drawn a stick man on a cloth and, and gotten people to believe it was real. This is this is just much too complex for me to, to attribute to a medieval forger. I mean, it seems to me that if you're going to go that route, the route to go is, well, the forgery happened in Palestine and then traveled to France. Like, if, if that's the route you're going to go, that would be a way better explanation. I'm not saying that's the case either, but I'm just saying. Yeah. Gotcha. All right, cool. So last question here from Creation Myths. And uh, so he's specifically asking, Bob, this is when you mentioned the the uh, skin effects issue, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. he's asking creation is he or she, I don't know, is uh, has this been demonstrated experimentally? Because this sounds like a testable mechanism. So have there been scientific experiments confirming that this mechanism of skin effects would actually produce the results you're, you're uh, talking about there? Uh, okay, well, uh, that's a prediction that I make for uh, flax fibers, that, that it would work. It works in conductors in general. Uh, I had a friend where uh, he was reading some of my work and, and I asked him, he, he is a, he's into power electronics. Uh, and I asked him uh, if he's familiar with the skin effect of an alternating current. And he said, I use it every day. So it's, it's a well-established principle that works, and it works in electrical engineering. Now, the, the prediction is that it would also work uh, in the, the, a, a flax fiber, uh, one-fifth the diameter of a human hair. So that test has to be done. Tom, go ahead. I saw you raise Yeah, I, I believe uh, Julio Fonte has a similar uh, type of hypothesis to Bob's, uh, his corona discharge, and I think he's actually run experiments, uh, and he's published them, uh, published photos and showing the results of, uh, of uh, his approach, and the images that he gets look uh, very similar to the shroud. I believe they're in his latest book, uh, and so uh, uh, the, the, the one on the holy fire, I think he's got some of the images in there, so... No, I just I just want to throw in. I see Bob's got his hand up, but uh, I thought because I remember uh, Dr. Kelly Kears sending me a paper on skin effects that he published maybe like a couple months ago or something. That, um, do you guys know about that? Anything about that? Like 
hasn't that been some experiments confirming it or I, I imagine that Kelly Kirsch would be writing about human skin. What, yes. where, so I'm referring to skin effect in the sense of electrons being forced to the outer radius of a conductor. They call that the skin of the conductor. Okay. So, so it's a vastly, di vastly different things. Okay. Good to know. All right. Cool. Uh, we did get one last question from someone else that I think is pretty good from Paul Bishop. Um, so he's saying Teddy Hall was once quoted as saying that no <laughs> Joe knows this uh, that no archaeological test should be based on one sample alone. So why did he agree to go forward with the test? So yeah, is there you know we know Harry Gov and stuff. They they mentioned all these problems in advance. Um, so why if they are in having uh, scientific integrity, why did they go ahead with this test to begin with? Politics, uh, agendas, money. Ego. Um, I've got 800 pages worth of questions like that in in my C14 book. Plus, uh, by the way, uh, I knew that I'd have more um, material after the book was published. So I have a paper on academia that has something like 80 over 80 additional entries um, of similar nature. Uh, but it it was it, it's very it was very political and. Um, you know, I it, it was not a, a scientifically rigorous test. End of story for me. I mean, I Jordan shaking his head. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, if it were me, and I was like, hey, it would be a much better test if you tested all these areas. And they're like, well, one, take it or leave it. I'd be like, okay. I mean, I, I'd still take it. Like, I'm not... <laughs> claim to fame. Yeah. I, I wanted. I wanted to. Uh, reference uh, Tom brought up the issue of a corona discharge in Giulio Fonte's hypothesis. Uh, I, I'd like to also mention here that in my derivation, I, I started not, not from the top down, but I start from the bottom up, from the evidence, reasoning logically and scientifically one step at a time. And that process led me uh, to confirm <laughs> that there was a corona discharge involved in image formation. So yes, that is part of my image formation hypothesis, that a corona discharge was involved in forming the alternating current in the fibers which scorch the outer perimeter of, of the circumference of the fibers. Awesome. Uh, yep, Tom, let me, uh, hold on. There you go. Yeah, to, to the last point, I uh, I believe, and, and uh, you know, Bob can maybe uh, validate this, that the uh, the charred material that exists that the shroud, that the people that have the shroud have collected could be tested, radiocarbon tested, and that would not do anything to the, to the shroud itself. It's just a bunch of, you know, charred linen, and they've got it in, from different parts of the shroud, and that would be a way of, of checking uh, uh, Bob's ideas on the neutron radiation, and you know it, it wouldn't create any harm to the uh, to the shroud itself. And it's a pity that you know people don't want to do that. I think Bob even put in a proposal for that yes. year, years ago that was not accepted. Yeah, so I, I understand that there's 42 different sample jars containing material that they uh, removed from the shroud in 2002, and that's just been sitting in the vault unused for any good purpose. So to me, it's just kind of a no-brainer that, that uh, if you took material from the right elbow area, uh, because that would be next to the uh, limestone wall with his head to the right, uh, then that would date, the prediction would be, uh, let's see, uh, 4,500 AD. Uh, if you take a sample from the left elbow, it would be about 3,500 AD. So you don't need to use a lot of material and, and a, a lot of different samples. You only need one or two. And, and so there's no other hypothesis making this prediction. It's either true or false. So it needs to be tested. Jordan, I saw you raise your hand. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, the whole non-destructive test reminded me of this. I did some really rough back of the envelope math on how much uh, radiation you might be able to detect from the C14 if it is elevated to future date levels. Uh, in the center part of the shroud. Um, I think you might be able to detect it with a well enough shielded setup with like a Geiger counter. 
Like, I don't think you would need, like, elaborate materials in order to detect that kind of elevated radi radiation. Um, I, I don't know if anybody else has done the math on that to check, because I, I, again, it was pretty rough. But, um, yeah, I think I, I think there's lots of non-destructive ways that you could test Bob's hypothesis, because one thing I have said many times, and I'll say it again, if there if there is a virtue of Bob's hypothesis, boy, does it make testable predictions. Yeah. And so, like... But it should be easy to falsify if it's false. And I, if they do a test and it shows the center of that shroud is four thousand, like two thousand years in the future, man. <laughs> yeah, it gets eight thousand five hundred. Whatever, right? however many years it is, I forget. But. Yeah. Yeah. See uh, that that a uh, right elbow uh, would only have about three or four times the amount of normal carbon fourteen in it. So that, that that's uh, you know according to my. Yeah. computer calculations based on, on my hypotheses that that would be a very reasonable date to expect uh, the the date for uh, under on the dorsal image below the center of the body would date to about 8500 so the the systematic error that, that we're talking about here uh, would be uh, up to the range of eight or nine thousand years well if anybody has a line of the pope i will buy the guy mm -hmm. counter and I'll pay my mm -hmm. way to Turin to do it myself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> awesome. All right, guys. So, uh, yeah, I I think we can wrap up now. If no one has anything else to say quickly. Or... All right, I, awesome. One, oh, one, one quick thing that I wanted to say is, as the skeptic here, I would just like to throw out there that personally, I would prefer a world where you all were right. I think it would be way cooler if this was jesus authentic burial shroud that would be just so much neater than what i think is likely true and so i would i would like to be shown wrong because if nothing else if we could say this actually buried jesus then the jesus mythicist could finally be shut up and i would love that so mm. uh i hope you guys are right i hope i'm wrong mm -hmm. uh but i don't think i am but yeah. <laughs> awesome. All right, yeah. well, I'll, I'll, I'll go around and let uh, each of you give like a quick closing word make any plugs you want to any books or websites or papers or YouTube channels, whatever you want to do. So, uh, uh, Bob, we'll start with you. And go around. Okay, well, of course, uh, on the research page, third page over on my website, my website is uh, www.shroud, spelled S-H-R-O-U-D, shroudresearch.net. On the research page, I have 37 papers that I've written. Uh, 13 of them are on carbon dating at this point. I would also like to recommend... Uh, Michael Kowalski's two videos that he put out uh, on carbon dating. Uh, and I, I still find them to be excellent. Awesome. Michael, over to you. Hopefully Bob didn't steal your thunder with those two videos. <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks, Bob. Um, uh, just, uh, well, first of all, I, I uh, as editor of the British Society for the Jury Shroud newsletter. I welcome anybody to visit our website, bstsnewsletter.com. And uh, it's very quick, easy, and inexpensive to subscribe to the newsletter. So welcome anybody there to uh, to come and join us. And especially you, John. <laughs> oh, awesome. Awesome. Joe, uh, Joe, over to you. Um, some of my, um, I think, Dale's going to post uh, links to my books. And uh, my academia page is independent.academia.edu slash uh, Joe Marino, no space in between with a capital. I don't know if it's case sensitive or not, but to, to be safe, put a capital J and a capital M for my last name. And I've got about 90 papers there on uh, most of the, the major uh, uh topics of the shroud and I also have a weekly email list if any of the listeners um would like to keep up on the latest videos podcasts news books articles uh you can send me an email at jmarino240 at aol.com um your email is not shared you can ask to be taken off the list anytime and I usually send them out uh weekly on Thursday nights awesome all right uh, Jordan over to you yeah, so I run, I have a hobby. I run a YouTube channel, Reason to Doubt. We're a channel on skepticism. So uh, we talk a lot about, you know, religious stuff, but we talk about aliens. We talk about Bigfoot. We talk about any kind of skeptical topic. Um, coming up in the near future, I have recorded the episode on the Invisible Reweave Hypothesis. So I think we're releasing that next week. 
Um, after that, we've got an uh, episode recording with some biologist friends of mine on race realism. That should be fun. Uh, I've got, I'm going to be talking to Christian cosmologist Jeff Swearank, I think, towards the end of the month, too, on the origins of the universe. So that should be cool. Uh, yeah, come check it out. Awesome. And last but not least, uh, Dr. Tom McAvoy, let me unmute you there. Yeah, Dale, I'll uh, send you a, a link so that if people are interested, they could uh, check out my book, God the Geometer, How Science Supports Faith. And it does have a couple of chapters on cosmology in there, Jordan. I'd like to thank Jordan. I think he's got a great uh, uh, personality and uh, is interesting to listen to. Uh, I've gone back and looked at uh, some of his podcasts, and I think it's uh, it's 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 neat that he was willing to come on and uh, participate in this panel. And I'd like to thank the other panelists as well. So thank you. It's, Dale. All, it's all the bow tie. That's the entire mm -hmm. personality. That's all it is. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And I'll just echo what you were saying there, Tom. I, I thank all of you guys for coming on. I, I wanted to do, my goal was the ultimate shroud show on the carbon dating, covering everything and, you know, trying our best to progress and, and try to get to an answer. So I, I think we've done a great job. If nothing else, we've progressed towards the truth. It seems like from what I've, from what I've heard and what I'm getting from all these experts. So, yeah, thank you guys so much for for coming on, uh, being great friends and great shroud scholars. Uh, whether you're skeptic or pro, you're you guys are scholars and gentlemen. So, thank you for that. And uh, just so the audience knows, uh, you're not going to get rid of me because guess what? You'll be seeing me in exactly half an hour on Faith Unaltered with Dr. Robert Junis arguing on uh, you guys are scientists so apparently uh robert Junis, he's a famous catholic apologist and he believes that the earth is uh he takes a geocentric model the earth is the center of the universe and the solar system so uh, uh i'm gonna have to refute him somehow and i i have half an hour to study <laughs> i mean he's right except that like so is everywhere else so like <laughs> Okay, okay. I like that. So maybe that's his trick. Yeah, he's got the Copernican principle. But all right, cool. Well, well, that's it. So yeah, I'll be seeing you guys on Faith and Altered in half an hour. And for the rest of you guys, have a have a great night. Take care. Yeah. Cheers, Dave. Right. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everybody. All right. All right. I'm hitting the red.